the special meeting of council of the Tuesday, the 8th of December, is now opened. I advise that the special meeting of council will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and recording will also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution to uh, you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council, including transfer outside of Australia. Item one is acknowledgement of the country. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal groups and other First Nations who are present today. Item number two is apologies and leave of absence, uh, which there are nil. Um, we have one item on the agenda tonight with a request for consideration in confidence. Uh, councillors, I look for a mover and a second for a motion to order the exclusion of public for the item 4.1 88 O'Connor Street. So thank you, Councillor Abraham, today. Second to Councillor Kerra. Members, uh, Councillor Murray. Can I ask, seeing this is uh, a development paid for by public monies, uh, why it is in confidence? See ya. Through you, Lord Mayor. It's explained in the in the confidentiality. Yes, I realise that's the other day, I think that it should be verbalised uh, to the public gallery. Through you, Lord Mayor, this is in the public part of the agenda. It explains it quite clearly. Could I have a verbal extract, please? I can read it if you'd like me to. I can't put it in your own words, you know, why a development of the public money needs to be in uh, Councillor Rand, I think it's been answered. It is uh, in the public agenda and um, if you uh, don't agree with it, then you can vote against it. Councillor Martin, you had a question? Uh, yes, look, uh, I have a, uh, a similar point of view. I, I think that the administration could have taken steps, for example, for the design of this proposal even to be made public for the many ratepayers who are anxious to see what it looks like and uh, to understand something about the development. But instead, the administration has chosen to bundle it with a great deal of information, uh, some of which I understand might be uh, required to be kept in confidence. But it's all been put together uh, and it will be released at a time that suits uh, the developer and the Lord Mayor uh, and, and the administration. The administration. Um, it, it seems to me that it is all about maximising opportunities for political advantage rather than sharing honest information uh, with the ratepayer. And I will vote against this being very important. Thank you for your comment, Councillor Martin. I don't think it's there for political advantage. So I think the explanation for consideration and confidence is very clear. Members, if there's no other comment, I'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Those against? That is carried. Uh, members of...
So let's begin. Hello, hello. Thank you. I'd like to advise that the uh, special meeting of the committee will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and a recording will also be published to the internet. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Please note, note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that uh, your presence and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly to, uh, by the Council, including Transferring Outside Australia. The Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to Elders past and present. We recognise and respect their culture, heritage beliefs and relationships with the land. We acknowledge that there are that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend the respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Apologies and reasons of absence, there's no one ever wants to here today. Fantastic. I now seek a mover and a seconder and to move the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on the 17th of November 2020 and the special meeting of the committee held on the 24th of November 2020 be taken as read and be confirmed as an accurate recording of the proceedings. So I seek a mover. Councillor Moran, uh, seconder. Councillor Kira, would you uh, uh, like to speak to it, Councillor Moran? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. Councillor Anyone would like to speak? Sorry, Chair, just a question of governance. I actually wasn't at the um, those two meetings, so do am I still able to vote or take a word of others that it's <laughs> Would anyone else like to speak to my to motion? Uh, okay. Uh, would like to vote? Those in favour? Those against? Let's carry. <laughs> We have our first presentation of 4.1 on the agenda for the East West Parkway. I have Clinton to introduce you. Yeah. Thank you um, through the chair. Uh, tonight's um, presentation is um, to be done in conjunction with the bikeways report for East West Bikeways, which is also um, in front of council tonight for, for questions. Um, tonight's committee meeting and this presentation follows on from the 2nd of November workshop that we had with Council, where we received feedback on uh, some of our thoughts um, and processes around trying to deliver um, what will be hopefully a feasible east-west bikeway solution um, for Council to deliver through the deed that we've entered into with the Department for Infrastructure and Transport. Um, given the complexity and importance of um, this report, um, this quick presentation is just to give a, a little bit of further context to the report to make sure that um, tonight members have a really good understanding of what we've done since the 2nd of November workshop. And we are, um, as I've stated previously, we are in your hands with this report. Um, it does provide some solutions and recommendations around what we believe to be a feasible recommendation for an East-West bikeway. Um, but we are in your hands um, to land, hopefully, our decision on East West Bikeways. Pass over to Dan now to present. Thanks, Clinton. So tonight's report will be presented on the East West Bikeway and seeking a decision at Council next Tuesday night on the Bikeway Corridor, the East West Bikeway Design Guide, the Delivery and Engagement Approach and Undertaking Evaluation. This presentation um, contains some of the key points of the report. A detailed economic analysis has not been undertaken for the project, nor has a detailed economic analysis been undertaken for other major bike infrastructure upgrade projects in Adelaide. The proposed route, however, has given consideration to the economic impacts of the proposed bikeway in relation to local issues such as property values, economic uplift and encouraging residential growth in the city consistent with the decision of Council from March 2020. Case studies from Australia as well as international cities um, with developing bike networks have been collated as a linked document to the report and provide context and an indication of the types of impacts and benefits that can be expected in Adelaide. For example, the Queensland Department of Transport and Main Roads has undertaken a study to quantify the economic benefits of people riding bikes. The study found that the wider economic benefits total approximately $1.40 for every one kilometre of bike travelled. 
This includes a wide range of benefits, including health, congestion improvements, vehicle operating costs, and noise and air quality. The figure also includes a disbenefit for personal injury. However, the, the benefits clearly outweigh the disbenefits. The City of Sydney has also commissioned independent research to, to quantify the benefits of proposed cycleways. The study found that for every $1 invested in the inner Sydney regional bike network, would return between $3.88 and $11.08 in benefits to individuals, government, and the general economy, including travel time savings, environmental benefits, savings related to public transport operations, infrastructure investment, and health benefits. Bike rider volumes on Frome Street have been analysed over the last few years. Um, before Frome Street Bikeway was installed, was we did some counts in 2013, and they're shown on the left-hand side of the screen. They're essentially pretty low, given that before the bikeway was installed, it was a four-lane road with no bike infrastructure at all. Counts were undertaken again in 2015 after the first installation of the bikeway. So when the functionality of a separated bikeway was, was installed between Carrington Street and Peary Street, um, and some bike volumes in some blocks are almost double what they were previously. However, in the un upgraded sections of the bikeway, volumes remain pretty much the same. And then again, counts were undertaken in 2019 following the most recent upgrade, which also extended the bikeway to Rundle Street. Some sections have increased substantially from the 20, 2015 upgrade. However, if you refer back to the 2013 previous volumes, some volumes, some blocks are more than double. However, the, the remaining block at Rundle to North Terrace remains pretty much the same, and that's a combination of no bikeway in place, no safe infrastructure, and the development works that are undertake, being undertaken at the moment. This image shows the provides the proposed corridor being Franklin Street, Flinders Street, Gawler Place and Wakefield Street. The connections that this route provides are West Terrace, Shared East Path, links to Port Road, Anzac Highway, and the West Side Bikeway to Clenelg in the western suburbs. Number two being Grey Street, which links up to the University Precinct at City West. Um, number three, Market to Bank Precinct at Bentham and Pitt Streets, linking to the central markets. Number four being Gawler Place, linking to the heart of the city in Rundle Mall. Number five being East at uh, Front Street Bikeway. And number six being the Eastern Parklands, which connects to Victoria Park and the Grant Avenue Bikeway, as well as Burnside and Norwood. The bikeway connects directly to several schools, as well as providing broader network options for students to ride safely to schools. We've developed an east-west bikeway design guide, which provides a toolkit and application for the bikeway design. Shown is an indicative section of bikeway, which includes garden beds with concrete curbs between the separated bike lane and traffic lanes, line marked buffer and flexi posts between the separated bike lane and parking areas, green road surface in the bike lanes across the intersections, and treatments at bus stops, which will aim to replicate those at the hotel drop-off zones on Frome Street at the moment. Different sections of road along the corridor have different widths, which will result in slightly different configurations for the bikeway project. Some sections will have one or two full-time lanes of traffic with full-time parking, whereas other sections will have two lanes of traffic in the morning and afternoon peaks with parking permitted at all other times. This design that we've, we're showing on the screen provides an opportunity to continue to upgrade the corridor in the future through asset renewal programs and the concepts and the design guide provide future-proofing opportunities which would allow space for further greening and tree planting in the corridor, including in the verge and in the median where the blue dashed line is. On street parking, the, the top image summarises the current utilisation of parking along the Flinders, Franklin and Great Wakefield corridors and the data is a combination of manual surveys undertaken in 2017 and smart parking data from October 2020. The data shows along both corridors, average utilisation is generally in the range of 40% to 70%. At peak times, however, parking utilisation is higher than the average is shown, for example, near schools or churches. The bottom end image takes into account the estimated reductions in parking along the proposed corridor. 
and predicts the parking demand relative to the number of spaces available with the bike lane in place. The majority of the park corridor shows the average parking demand based on the data will be accommodated within the remaining available parking spaces. The western end of Franklin Street, west of Morford Street, however, utilisation is above what the parking is available. However, this does not take into consideration adjacent side streets or parallel corridors, which do have spare capacity. We've developed two delivery and engagement approaches, both of which are mindful of timing implications and the importance of engagement with stakeholders along the corridor and beyond. Both options follow the same principles of engagement, which are the engagement will seek the views of all impacted community members and stakeholders, consistent with our responsibilities as a capital city, community, capital city council. Once the bike way route has been approved by council, the alignment will be non-negotiable through the engagement process. The neg negotiable rules to be considered with the community and stakeholders through the engagement process will focus on controls applied to on-street parking spaces, i.e. whether a space will be loading, short-term parking or motorbike parking and the like, and location of trees and landscaping, noting the design and budget constraints would need to be considered as well. The iterative delivery and engagement approach is preferred over the traditional approach due to once the alignment of the SS bikeway is approved by council, it offers a focused delivery and engagement approach that would provide a means of delivering on a key activity of council strategic plan and the business plan and budget. It's more likely that the installation of the bikeway will commence prior to the end of the funding deed in 2021. In June 2021. It provides adjacent stakeholders with an opportunity to provide input regarding proposed parking controls prior to the implementation of the bikeway, and it provides council with the opportunity to proactively seek feedback from the whole community on the actual impacts of the bikeway once it's in place and plan adjustments as required, as well as opening up a discussion with the community about the longer term vision for these streets that could inform future investment decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. But uh, with leaving the meeting, I would like to bring forward item uh, 5.4, uh, which is the discussion on the East West Parkway. Is that okay with the members? Um, so, can we go straight into questions? So, anyone got any questions? Councillor, please. Thank you, um, Chair, and um, thanks very much for the presentation and for the work that's being done on this. One of the elements that I find a little confusing is the inclusion of the um, dog leg. Can you explain to me why um, that's come about um, and uh, why the decision's been made to kind of carve that, that out? What's the rationale for that? We've, we've looked at the multiple corridors in quite a lot of detail and particularly the width of the corridors and the valuable space to essentially minimise the impacts to parking, to traffic, as well as trying to link into existing infrastructure. So the Wakefield end of the, the project obviously links in with um, the Parklands Trail directions to north and south at the crossing point. It also picks up a lot of storms along that corridor which would have not been picked up if we selected a single straight line through the city. Wouldn't it have been easier just to continue it along down Flinders Street? Like, why is that being carved out, that section? That section in the, in, in the east is a lot narrower <coughs> and would have a lot of parking impacts as well as some tree impacts down that eastern end. So it's got nothing to do with the views of some of the businesses that are nearby that were making a lot of noise? <laughs> we, we, haven't, we haven't had an opportunity to undertake extensive consultation no. So it just strikes, <laughs> it just strikes <laughs> me that it would have been easier to continue along that yeah, area. Ignore the objectors, and then it goes like that. Ignore the new objectors. Well, it just strikes me that it would have been easier to continue that along, as was part of the original um, proposal. So I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand um, what the rationale uh, is for the change. I guess the, the other question I have is around um, Gawler Place. Uh, how do you envisage, in terms of the dog leg, that working um, and protecting the safety of cyclists as well? Because some have expressed concerns to me around that element. 
Um, the operation of Gawler Place between Flint and Wakefield would operate with the contraflow bike lane so in the southbound direction of bikes, which would still be separated and would still maintain the, the number of traffic lanes at the intersection. And the access to it would be via the signalised intersection at each end via a hook turn arrangement. And we're still to obviously work out the finer detail of how that would operate. But it'd likely be a dedicated cycle phase. Could um, Gawler Place be closed off to traffic? And so it's just for cyclists and pedestrians. Is that something that could be looked at? There's, there's a major car park down there. So we just <laughs> out. God forbid we can't lose any car parking. That's right. But I just wonder, you know, that could, could um, potentially be an option in terms of um, improving safety for cyclists, but also, you know, pedestrians too. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, it wasn't in the uh, presentation um, and I couldn't find uh, in the report. So I'm just wondering if you could point me to where uh, in the report uh, we're, we're told uh, the actual number of parking spaces that will be lost uh, in the proposed uh, bikeway uh, overall. No, I like I didn't read it. Yeah, I just I couldn't see it. But I think it was a link. Read it, you would have seen it. So I see in link document one, there's a section on, on the parking. Link section. Oh, what, well, can you can you tell us then uh, if it's a link, what, what is the actual number please, of parking spaces overall that will be lost to the city in the Approximately 170. Okay, 170. Um, do you have or have you conducted any basic uh, investigation of the uh, economic value uh, on average per parking space to the city uh, relevant to those 170 spaces? <laughs> no. However, we've looked at the utilisation in a lot of those spaces. A lot of them are unutilised at the moment. You've got you've got question you've got um, material presented at the outset of the report that is very uh, positive about the economic benefits of the bikeway. Um, you've got material presented at the beginning of the report uh, about purported uh, synergies or purported um, uh, extra value from bringing in a bikeways as opposed to not having bikeways. Can I ask, is there a reason for such a basic, obvious economic uh, uh, fact of importance as the cost of lost parking spaces being absent essentially from this report? Can I answer that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Kerr. 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 In order to answer your question, I think um, it, it doesn't seem to really matter what route we consider. Um, there are compromises in terms of whether it's parking or traffic lanes or um, Thanks. access Thanks. issues regardless of the route. So okay, thank you. Um, look, I don't consider that to be, that to be sufficient. Maybe if I rephrase the question, why is any uh, evaluation or any uh, uh, information about the economic cost related to lost parking absent when you've got statements at the outset about the economic benefits of having uh, this proposed by Thanks, Bruce. Uh, through the chair, I think um, in reference to what um, Dan has said, um, the cost, the economic um, disbenefit of losing parks has been offset by the fact that we still believe through the figures and data presented to us that the parks can still be utilised to their current levels of, of economic drive. How do we know that when you have not quantified what the loss is from the loss of the parking space? Can I just remind members that the questions go through the chair? Through the chair, through the chair, please. How do, <laughs> how do we know that? How do we possibly know that? when there's been no effort at quantifying the economic loss from parking space. Here you go. Clinton, we'll take the one, do you think? At, at this stage, um, get, get the point of your question. We've answered as best we can, but we'll do some further research and provide the council okay. members to All right, thank you. Councillor Hyde. Um, thanks, Chair. I, I suppose I have, I have a few, um, questions. 
Um, mainly around talking about economic uplift, and I take it from Councillor Kim's comments, there was some discussion around economic uplift um, that would happen as a result of this. But I, I, I want to understand what has been the economic <coughs> uplift of the Frome Street bikeway? Separated bikeway? <laughs> Thanks, Dan. You've, you've included some reference to that in the report. Can you respond? I saw, I saw, I saw uplift in cycling numbers, um, and whether you've got a particular dollar figure you want to attribute to them, I'd be happy to consider it. But I'm talking about the precinct, the city, the businesses. I mean, we often get this thrown at us at this retail uplift, and the property prices go up. But all I saw in that report was that property prices haven't gone up, and we have no other. We have no other, you know, stick with which to measure uplift. So, what what do we got? Uh, through, through the chair, that is correct. Obviously, since the major upgrade in <coughs> which was pretty recent, and obviously not long after that, we've had the whole COVID downturn. Um, we've spoken to our internal raise team, who've given us some advice, which is included in the linked attachment, which shows that there's been no material change. However, some of that was included in a previous year's assessment values, but then it's, it's too short a time to, I guess, recognise some of that value. And obviously, the developments along that corridor of, I guess, shorter or longer term things than shorter term benefits. Right. So, so, so does that mean? I'm, I'm a little bit. I, I'm, I'm confused. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm confused, Chair. Um, as to what the benefit was that, that we're talking about here. But can I also, on that, on that same line of questioning, um, last committee meeting, we heard from our audit committee who said that we need to do uh, cost-benefit analyses for every infrastructure project that we do. Has there been a cost-benefit analysis performed on this? Because I haven't seen one. See ya. Well, that, sorry, Councillor Sims, that was the advice of the um, Thanks, audit Clinton. committee. Uh, through the chair, I'd have to take that on notice, Councillor. Um, we're working to a deed um, with the department at the moment and trying to deliver on that deed. Whether a so economic analysis was done, I'm not sure. So none of the executive can tell me whether or not a cost-benefit analysis have, has been done on this project that we're approving next week? I'm sorry, point of order, Chair. I'm getting very concerned with the tone of this questioning, not just from um, Councillor Hyde, but Councillor Kira, where administration answer a question and then the question That's is, not a valid point of order. Well, what's the point of order? Now, if I can just finish. If I can just finish. Councillor Sim, total question. Members, members, members. Please. Sorry, Chair, if I could just finish my, my point. I am getting concerned about that style of questioning because I think it is bordering on badgering the staff who have answered the question. And so I, I would encourage you to shut down the line of questioning when the answer has already been answered by administration. Councillor Sims, administration. I appreciate your, your point of clarification, but I'm going to give the opportunity for the question to be asked. And if they need to go offline to have it answered, I then that's what no, we um, the asked, direction yeah. with administration have just given. Once it is answered, no, what, then what the question is, uh, is this intrusion that actually allowed under the low toning tone of question? Uh, where, where, okay, where the members, questions I would like order. everyone just to stick to questions to administration on this subject, please. So I have uh, Councillor Sims. No, 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 you've got oh, no, me. I think oh, no, you, you've got me because oh, Councillor yeah. Sims cut me oh. off. Didn't it, it, was a, it was a point of order. It cut me off. Um, so again, I'll, I'll return to my original original question, which so was. Can you clearly ask the question the, that the you question, would like the to question, ask? The question that I asked was um, that no one in the administration can tell me whether there has been a cost benefit analysis performed on this project that we are being asked to approve for next week. Through you, Lord Mayor, as far as I'm aware, we have not done a comprehensive cost benefit analysis. The information that we have has been provided to you to enable the project to proceed in line with the deed. Mm -hmm. If it's inadequate in by way of content, then you as a council will need to decide whether that's appropriate or not and instruct the administration. And and so by extension then, CEO, would would we is it yeah, am I then correct in presuming that the administration is asking us to disregard the advice of the audit committee? that was given to us a mere couple of weeks ago in approving an infrastructure project that has not had uh, that, that cost benefit done to it. I 
believe the question has been answered, Councillor. Well, no, 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 that, that is a very separate question. I'm asking about the advice of the Audit Committee and how it relates to the project in front of us. Yeah. It's a yes or no answer. It's through you, Lord Mayor. Oh, Lord Mayor, sorry. <laughs> Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, this is a project that has been in train for a number of years. It's been a funding allocation provided by the state government for a number of years. And as an administration, we're trying to achieve the objectives of the funding agreement and deliver the project. I concede that the Audit Committee independent members came to Council last week and talked about the need for cost benefit analysis to be provided for new and, and further projects. But my belief is that we need to conclude this work um, as best we can with the information and um, I guess the considerations as best possible. Failure to do that will mean that we won't, con won't, won't con conclude the project within the time frame required. So it is not ideal, I get, but we're doing the best we can to deliver the project at this time. Should we receive further funding for new projects? Um, and should we be embarking on new projects? I take the advice of the audit committee members that we would need to provide a detailed cost benefit analysis, and we would do that as a matter of course. So, so we're concerned about Through the money chair. expiring. Thank you, Chair. We're concerned about the money expiring. However, um, we're disregarding the advice of the committee. And can can I just get an understanding? Has anyone in the administration, um, uh, or in fact the Lord Mayor, approached the state government and perhaps uh, spoken to them about? the need for an extension because of the global pandemic or the fact that we're still waiting on the city access strategy that was meant to be done by now. You voted against CEO. Um, through you, Chair. Um, on a number of occasions throughout this period where we've been talking about this project, we have sought and have been granted extensions. Um, in the last few days, I've also further approached uh, the relevant agency to see if a further extension could be achieved. I'm yet to receive a response to that. So it is possible that we could receive a further extension. However, uh, the last extension that was provided, um, when I spoke to the relevant person, it was on the basis that we would in fact deliver the project um, as is proposed. Was so that pre-pandemic though? It was pre-pandemic. Right. Yep. So there could be justification to seek an extension. Right. Um, am, I, am I correct in understanding um, that a, a, as yet there hasn't been any proactive engagement with any of the stakeholders along the precinct? So none of the businesses, schools, churches? Thank you, CEO. Through the chair, I think it's been outlined in the report, the approach we're going to be taking. So in answer to your question, um, there hasn't been a, a wholesale engagement process taken uh, uh, prior to this report coming to you. That is part of the process going forward and is necessary if we're going to deliver within the time frame. So, so we're, we're being asked to select a route without having spoken to the people along that route. Is that... CEO? So choose first, ask them what they think. After. CEO, that's the question. Is that effectively what we're doing? Through the chair, um, as is outlined in the report, um, yes, that's the only way we can achieve the delivery of this project. We've identified a route, we've determined it's the most appropriate, and we will be going forward with that that route, um, and we will consult as we progress with the design. Now, that's the only way we can achieve it, quite frankly, within the time frame. Alternative to that, seek an extension. Um, if that's achieved, then we could then revisit the time frame and we could then reset and decide to go through a more detailed mm -hmm. consultation process. But that is unknown at this time. Yeah. Um, uh, Chair, uh, turning now to the to the information that we've been provided with or, or haven't been provided with, um, I'd like to I'd like to ask because it seems that there was no crash data or any sort of information, which I understand can be garnered from the Department of Infrastructure and Transport. There was no crash data in the report. So I actually don't know how this street compares with another street, either for cyclists or cars or pedestrians or what have you. Um, so is there any indication that Franklin Street is particularly unsafe for cyclists? Because the anecdotal evidence I have is that people on there that use it, uh, they use it because it is safer already and they're a bit bemused at this option. So. Um, what does the what does the data actually say? Uh, CEO. Yeah, thanks, Dan. We haven't got crash data included in the report, 
However, the intent of the bikeway is to encourage a safe facility to encourage more people to get on their bikes and ride. So this is not the, the current people who are happy to ride down West Terrace or ride down Franklin Street or Flinders Street, which have non-compliant narrow bike lanes at the back of Vang Park. This is to, to cater for them, but to encourage new trips as well. But I'm Councillor Hyde, I think we're just going to move on. I'm ask trying to. Well, other no, other no, questions. We can come back if you like, but can we? I have some. I have some very valid questions. Can we come here. back and let others ask some questions? Well, I can use time now. Or I can use time after. Well, you can if you like, but I think we need to move I'll on. I'll be guided ask. by you. Then. Thank so you. Support your decision, Chair. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Sims, you were next on my list. Oh, good call. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to ask a, a question about um, car parking. There's been lots of references to uh, car parking in this debate. I'm just wondering um, whether administration are able to advise how much car parking we have currently in the city of Adelaide and whether or not we do in fact have a, a car parking shortage as seems to have been suggested by some. CEO. Yeah, through you, um, Chair, I think it's feasible for us to get, get, gather that information and circulate it. Yeah, we have that data already put yeah. together. Claire, you might want to speak. Through the presiding member, I think um, uh, the last time there was car parking data count, um, we looked at on street, our own off street car parks, and obviously private car parks too. I think from memory it was around 48,000 48, in total. Yeah, because my recollection is that the city of Adelaide has more car parks than any other um, city in Australia through the chair. Is that correct? Um, at the last um, published data, but it was quite old. It was um, a few years ago. That was correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just to um, tease out further to Councillor Hyde's um, questioning through you, uh, Chair, to the CEO, you referenced um, CEO the potential to go back to the government again and to potentially try and seek an extension. My recollection was uh, from a previous um, committee uh, meeting discussion um, was that actually the government were not likely to entertain such requests. At least that was the view of the administration, I think, at the time. Is that still your view that, that, that that's pretty unlikely? Because my understanding of this was that time really is of the essence in terms of us getting something happening. CEO? Through you, Chair. When I sought that extension last time, um, there was some commentary around um, that we really need to get on and deliver. And so the impression I received was that that extension was seeking to be the last extension. Now, I must say, there's nothing to prevent us asking again. Um, and, and I don't know what the answer will be. As, as has been suggested, we have gone through a difficult period as a community, um, and so things may be more tolerant at this time. But at the time I asked the question, I think it was considered to be the last extension. And, and if the government were um, to deny the request, then they would simply take back the money and we would not then be in a position to um, complete the East West Bikeway during this term of council. Through the Chair, that's correct. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Um, Thanks, Chair. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, yeah, just a few insights into the history. Um, I moved a motion that we ask up whether we'd spend the $3 million on existing infrastructure, such as putting green uh because I know what's going on here. Um, I think that um, uh, people should say, admit that um, they're not going to vote for it, whatever. Uh, like, the reason it's got a dog leg is because there's a powerful political lobby which I agree with, um, in Flinders Franklin Street. That's what dog makes, to avoid their businesses. The lawyers were, oh, the lawyers were extremely upset about it and no, no, no amount of uh, saying that your businesses will do better, blah, blah, you're losing hundreds every car parks, will convince them. That is why we can't consult now because you never convince the businesses that are parked right outside their, side their business uh, being removed and then put cyclists down is going to improve the business. They just don't believe it. it I'm not saying it's not true, um, but they don't believe it. So there is no point. If you're going to do an off uh, a separated bike path, you just have to do it. Um, I'm not saying that's what I want to do, but that's what you have to do. The obvious, the correct street to put this bike 
part down. It's too late in the day to do go back. When we identified with voluminous studies is Sturt Halifax Street. Now you might remember a previous council built a really terrible um, separated bikeway in Sturt Street, which we had to rip up. So Sturt Street was sort of like pox then. But of course, Sturt Street's a big one <coughs> street. It feeds straight <coughs> into the, uh, the uh, Victoria Park Racecourse uh, bikeway and in the West Terrace, the West Terrace bikeway. It ticked all the boxes. Very few businesses, very wide street, enormously low, a very low traffic count. This dog leg is, is, a, is a dog leg, is a dog of an idea. Um, oh. To actually, no, no, I think a separated bike path is a good idea, so don't get me wrong. It's just that I know why we're doing the dog leg, and it's nothing to do with that. But cyclists will just keep going. They won't take the dog, bike, dog leg to start with, because people don't sort of let's find a way around here. And so all the administrative stuff we're told is not true. It's just because of the political lobby. Uh, which I actually agree with. Um, we Council should Moran, go back. Can we stick to questions? If you have any questions? Oh, well, are we still questions <laughs> or something? Okay. <laughs> um, so I've I given you a bit of leeway. Right. Isn't that so? Um, <laughs> I think we should go. Uh, what, did, have you still got the old documentation about Sturt Halifax Street? Because we could do that tomorrow. You don't have to ask anybody. It's all very nuts and birds. <laughs> and I'm riding bikes. No, is that a question, yeah. Councillor Moran? Well, have we still got the. Um, we did a consultation in Sturt. We actually built a separated bike park there. People loved it, except it was really a terrible design. Um, have we still got the. Um, can we turn on a dime and quickly approach the government with Sturt, Sturt Halifax again? Have we got that information? CEO. We've done all the work. We built a separated bike lane. I mean, we consulted, it's all there. Claire, is he trying to say something? So. <laughs> this one a, is a non flyer. Um, from memory council, on Miranda, there was a real um, challenging, dangerous issue with that design on Sturt Street. So if yes. you remember, uh, I think the challenge was that the angle parking was retained um, and uh, cars would reverse out into the cycle lane. So uh, I think that was the, um, the yeah, at that point, um, that fed into then the, um, the approach taken for Smart Move, which talked to a um, a different approach to how we design cycle well, lanes. Claire, wouldn't it be the case that once, we, having having uh, learned from the experience of the design in Sturt Street, we would then change the parking arrangements in Sturt Street to accommodate the bike park, and that would be a lot easier than trying to punch this through in an inappropriate street. Yeah. People in the southwest corner, as the um, the, rest of the uh, ward councillors know, are very into cycling and have a completely different mindset to the lawyer, uh, legal chambers in Flinders Franklin and um, Gawler Place now. They would like it there. They did like it there. But of course, people backing out of their driveways kept killing the cyclists. So they didn't like it there anymore. But we can, we know now how to design separated bypass and they need parallel parking, not angle parking. And if you drive down Sturt Street, which I do quite often, you'll see that the parking is not heavily utilised there. There wouldn't be the enormous reaction if you did Sturt and Halifax. My husband is a cyclist because it's easier for him to drive between hospitals on, him, on his bike. And he said it's just ludicrous that we're not putting it down a big empty street like that with business and people that would welcome it. Can, uh, can I ask? Okay. Um, I I say this, a this, is, this is this is not going to happen. Not Helen's easy. never going to get a separated bike park with easy. the people that she sits with on that side of the road. Thanks, Mr. Moran. I just want to uh, ask administration: Would it be possible to circulate the plans on the? Uh, no, we don't. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, look, I really think that you know the reason that we're trying to put a bike path in the areas that we're looking is because the destination is people going to work or yes. going to school. No, it's no. not because they're trying to get across the city. It's, and if you look at the um, the current cyclists, you know we know that the highest is Perry Weymouth, and then it's Flinders Franklin, and then it's Weymouth or Road. Um, I think it really comes back to the. Everybody just has to work out whether they've got the appetite for a bike path or not. And if they don't, then we just put this away because 
we've looked at Flind we've looked at Kipiri Waymouth, we looked at Flinders Franklin, we looked at Great Waymouth, now we're looking at Wakefield Franklin and the dog leg is okay because it still goes down to um, Rundle Mall and it still brings them into the centre of the city, which is where most of the cyclists want to be. It also connects at the other end to West Terrace and to the high school. Um, and you know, and yes, you're right. The reason it's not going down Flinders Street is, is because the lobby was so strong Lord that Mayor, it's not going to go there. Do you have a question? Well, <laughs> and, <laughs> and my <laughs> question is that given given we haven't done a consultation process, um, and you know, and I do take your point, Anne. It's like you either have to have the guts to do it, or you don't, because the consultation process, you're not going to make everybody happy. So. Um, nor do I think whether we do a traditional or an iterative, we're going to get the same feedback because according to this, is the only two things they can talk about is the car parking in the immediate vicinity or the landscaping in the immediate vicinity. But there's no discussion about the route or where it's going to go to. <laughs> um, hang on, I'll come up with a question in a minute. <laughs> so, I would be very keen to know because I have, we haven't, I know the administration has spoken to administration, but I haven't spoken to the minister or the premier whether they're whether we want to look at a level of consultation because uh, like some other members, I've been contacted as well about various things in, in that street. Um, and it seems to be more about the fact that nobody's spoken to them than about it going down the street. I think, um, I, can't, I can't see if there's any other path for us to go. And I, I do actually think, and I'll, I'll go back to your, and all Daniel, your you know, question. If, if you, if, if we say no to this, then we're done, aren't we? Because we've explored every other part. Well, can't we go for the money? That was my question. <laughs> your question is actually, Lord <laughs> Mayor, uh, I think that was answered before. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Martin. Uh, yes, I had a question of the administration. Um, is uh, the cost of constructing a bikeway with a dog leg um, through Gawler Place to Wakefield Street going to be significantly greater than running a bikeway straight down to the street. Line. See you. <coughs> through the Chair, I understand because of the route change it could actually be more cost efficient. But I'll ask Dan to We haven't looked at that in a lot of detail. In, in my opinion, they'd be both pretty much the same. Um, obviously, the, the Gawler Place addition to the additional lake is pretty minor infrastructure down there. Okay, and seeing as we're all admitting now that uh, this dog leg has been created because of community pressure, uh, well, a very small community, um, but pressure, um, a stakeholder suggested to me today that council had received either the Lord Mayor, the CEO or the entity legal threats, that is threats to initiate legal action against council if we pursued a Flinders uh, Franklin bikeway, particularly down Flinders. Is that correct or not? CEO? This was a chair, not that I've seen, I don't know if the administration, no, not that I'm aware of. Verbal threats? No. Not still is. Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Chair. I'll resume from where I was in my list. Um, so we don't have any crash data or safety data. And, and, I, chair, and, I, and I acknowledge, I acknowledge that. Not, no, 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 but I just want to understand, are we going to get that? Can we get that before we make a decision? And can I please have a comparison? Anyway, well, well thank you, Councillor Donovan. Members, I'll decide what members, I make my judgment Members, please. He's asked a question. I would direct it to administration. CEO. Is, I don't know how safe it is or isn't currently, and I don't know how safe other corridors <coughs> are or aren't currently, and I would like to know before I choose. Through, um, through the chair, the, the report that has been prepared for you has within it all the information that we have to date. If you don't have adequate confidence in that information, then direct the administration to provide it to you. That's what the Can it be an undertaking? No, it will need to be something that you'll do at the council meeting next week. So this is going to come in. I want some simple, probably publicly available data that transport planners yeah. would know. 
and I can't get that before the fact. Could we be uh, too much uh, administration time? Sorry. Could we be provided that before? It'll take six hours. <laughs> I move that we do not receive. Through, through the chair, we can provide basic crash data. We do have that information. But in general terms, the report is the report. Happy to take direction from Council at the meeting next week. Um, to progress okay. Thank you, CEO. Furthermore, um, particularly regarding, so 15,000 motorists a day use the busiest part of Franklin Street. Um, that's the, the section that will have its carriageways affected the most. Has there been any modelling done uh, by the administration that would inform us as to where uh, that traffic would go? See you. Thanks, Dan. So during the during the peak hours, I understand how it operates, but is there any modelling that shows me during the off peak hours in particular, you, you're losing a whole lane of traffic. Presumably, there's still a number of cars that use that lane of traffic. Where is it going to be decanted off to? Where are we expecting demand to rise in elsewhere in the city? And what what happens to the vehicles along that existing corridor? Do we expect travel times to blow out? Has it been modelled or not? Uh, through the chair, traffic modelling has not been undertaken for off-peak periods. Okay, but it has been undertaken for on-peak periods? At some key intersections. However, during, during the peaks, the number of lanes through intersections is maintained. Outside of the peaks, the traffic volume is reduced significantly and from, from my experience, would be able to be accommodated within the traffic lanes. So if you look at Frame Street, again, similar arrangement. During the peak hours, you've got two lanes of traffic in each direction. Off peak, it's down to one lane in each direction. Volume's a lot lower. And so, so focusing on the intersections, which you have done a little bit more work on, uh, are we actually are we losing? Uh, are we going to be losing left turn lanes, dedicated left turn lanes at all along Franklin Street? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. At signalised intersection, yes. We will lose them at signalised intersections. So presumably, if people wish to turn left at a signalised intersection, they will now be also uh, disrupting uh, the outermost lane of traffic in their particular direction until they turn around the corner. That's correct. Have we, uh, the chair, that, are those please. the intersections, sorry, Chair, are those the intersections that we've modelled or do we understand what that does at peak times or? No, we, we haven't got a full understanding of that. However, during peak hour in the CBD, we do expect some form of congestion. And again, like those left turn lanes, at the moment, a lot of the left turn lane the vehicles in there do block the through vehicles as the queues extend back. Right. So are you saying with this, so obviously everyone expects congestion at peak hour, but are you saying we're going to have increased congestion as a result of the separated bikeway, the loss of those turn lanes and what have you? Uh, through the chair, there may be an increase in congestion, but traffic throughout the city sort of rebalances and comes to an equally equilibrium. But we haven't modeled it. No. Okay. Councillor Kira. Just one brief question through you, Chair. Um, it was stated by the administration that the purpose of this is to, uh, uh, well, one of, the, one of the purposes is to encourage people uh, to take up the cycle uh, in the first instance in the city. Um, I'm just wondering whether this, the dog leg design, does that present a danger in that uh, your, your stated purpose is to encourage people to take up cycling uh, to begin with in the city, but then they're cycling down a separated bikeway, uh, which then dog legs, but what about those, won't they be inclined to simply just keep going um, because that's just uh, quicker and easier, but doesn't that present a danger in it? The people who are for the first time being told, especially elderly, very encouraged, we want, you know, got a separated bikeway, it's safe, but suddenly it stops and they'll just keep going. Is that something that can be factored in, that sort of extra danger that um, this presents? Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Uh, through the chair, it is possible that people will continue going, however, it's pretty difficult to control behaviour. Yeah, but my, my question is, can the danger, the element of danger that this presents, um, can that be factored into uh, any further yes, material we provide? Yes, you're never going to vote for it. Give it up. Well, it's a joke. No, it's just wasting our time. It no, but, 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 but it, 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 it might say, say, it, I didn't say I wasn't going to vote for it. it. I voted for Sturt and Halifax Street. I'm on the Sturt and Halifax Street bandwagon. Members, have you got any more, has anyone got any more questions? Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Through the chair, um, in terms of car park utilisation, just to better understand, if you have 100 car parks and only 70 of those are used, 
and you remove 20 car parks, so you still have a surplus of 10, is there any cost, is there any value lost of those 20 car parks that were not utilised in the first instance and have been removed? You've got 100 to start off with, only 70 are used. You remove 20. No, they didn't you still have 10. <laughs> Is there any loss, any economic loss in that situation? No, no, we've never tested it. <laughs> Would you say? Uh, through the chair, um, generally no. However, at peak times, those, those figures quoted are average figures. Obviously, at times when the utilisation is above average, there would be a loss. Thank you. Thank you. And do we undertake a separate cost benefit analysis on every road project that we undertake within the City of Adelaide? No. So transport, we would seem to be, we already understand the value of transport projects. So we wouldn't undertake a separate cost benefit analysis every time we put in a road or a bikeway or a footpath. Through the chair, Councillor Jonathan, just a reminder. But each question through the chair. chair. Of course, through the chair. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Um, through the chair, a lot of those other road projects are funded through asset renewal programs. And it is, I believe, through the chair that it is part of our um, remit and it is part of our policy that we will, wherever possible, within asset renewals, not only undertake simultaneous upgrades to all forms of the asset, including an aspiration to improve safety for all road users. Would that be correct? Through the chair, that would be correct. And so the information that you provide at the beginning, for example, with the City of Sydney, that there is a cost benefit analysis that has been undertaken that yields a benefit of $3.80 to $11 something for every dollar spent. We would use that sort of data when we would consider cost benefit analyses for these sorts of projects. Would that be right? Uh, through the chat, in the absence of any local data, that's the best we've got available. Can I ask Clinton just to clarify uh, Through the chair, sorry, just in terms of the clarification around the asset renewals, um, there is no council policy or um, decision to um, do enhancements or further upgrades when we go in and do asset renewals. So but we do things simultaneously and we would always seek to, I believe, through the chair, and we would always seek to comply to, for example, DDA compliance, etc. Yeah, sorry, I'm worried about the tone here and the battery <laughs> oh, administration. Oh, it's a point of order. It must be. It must be valid. Uh, yeah. uh, through the chair, um, asset renewals typically is a like for like. Um, if that like uh, has to comply to a new standard, then we would obviously upgrade to that new standard. Yep. Thanks. And is it true, um, through the chair, that uh, administration has been unable to consult on the bikeway through to due to previous decisions of council? Hence, there has been the consultation has been in fact lacking due to a decision of this council. Uh, no, through, um, through the chair, look, there has been multiple decisions of council, which has caused us to have to change change course um, with this project. So it has been a problem. Thank you. And again, through the chair, um, in regard to the cyclist crash data, would you please just explain again why that's not an important consideration when you are looking at the specific route for a separated bikeway? Thanks, Dan. And through the chair. So obviously people who have the confidence and ability to ride a bike at the moment do so out on the streets. What we're trying to do is improve the safety for those and encourage new people to ride bikes. Okay. Don't currently at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. And again, through the chair, is it true that um, utilisation rates of bikeways are logarithmic in terms of their access utilisation and the logarithm looks at the network, not a single path. Therefore, the aspiration typically of a council would be to create a network of separated bikeways, and that would give the logarithmic increase not only in the uptake of users, the number of people who will access the, the bikeway, but also provide that logarithmic, or also provide the increase to retail expenditure, um, property value, etc. Therefore, any data that we were to look at at the moment, when we're looking at a single bikeway that is thus far incomplete, would likely not yield a true benefit 
or a true indication of the value because we don't yet have any type of network. So by providing the East West. That's it, that's it, that's it. Actually, it can I just it say, it members, it true. members, members that's a true. really long question, um, uh, Councillor Donovan. And if there's any questions that anyone has further to I'm this, I'm still awaiting take ones from the is it true? Yeah, well, okay. Um, see you. <coughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's, no. no. Um, sorry, could we get the question repeated or can we say so, that? Yes. <laughs> um, so the question um, was through the chair, is it true that the, the benefits that arise from a separated bikeway come from a network and that that is logarithmic, i.e. if you have 50% of one bikeway that will yield a very minimal uh, benefit, but as soon as you add a set a second part of the network and a third and a fourth, you don't get just twice the value or three times the value. The value is logarithmic, so it becomes consistently more and more and more valuable by more than you are adding to the network, and that value arises in property values, retail expenditure. So if we were to a phase one of the question, would that be true? <laughs> Uh, can we take that on notice? Um, can we take that on notice? Yep. Okay. You can, might need to send that question to administration. They can answer that for you. Any other questions? Councillor Canal, someone else to speak. This will be hopefully a real question. Um, just, we, just we talk about um, you know, the, the car parking, etc. And of course, that's really a pretty big issue for, for small businesses. Um, are we able to have a look at, uh, because if we're taking some away there, and then a lot of the car parking is required at out of uh, hours rather than necessarily during peak, can we see uh, the loss of that uh, the car parking on the street, how far back that, we need, that, it needs, that people need to go? In other words, here's my loss of car parks here. Can we show that it, the car parks that are adjacent that would not normally be uh, uh, you know, overused for particular times that, you know, say, well, this is how much uh, how far someone would have to go? Uh, to uh, to have a car park that is close to where they can get to, because that, that alleviates some of it. Because again, people don't know. I think so. If we, you know, if, if something like that's possible, that just helps us to to uh, um, you know give pro into proportion you know the, the inconvenience that someone may have. Um, is that a question? What yes. Question? Yeah. I don't think that was a real question. No. <laughs> and <laughs> just as another one, um, you know, obviously with, with the central market uh, redevelopment. Uh, there's going to be, I take it, the, the, right next to the bus station, that is, is also a car park, or will be, I suspect, the conversation has been that way. Can can we have that uh, looked at as part of this as well? Because obviously it sits right on uh, Franklin Street and therefore uh, would be you know, a significant um, relief, you know, for again any, any car parks that are lost for at least three years and it gives us an opportunity. That's okay. It. Any other questions? Councillor Hyde, Councillor Martin. Well, just just prompted through Councillor Donovan's interrogation is the um, the if the crash data is relevant along a corridor, the, the usage data as it stands is irrelevant along a corridor because you're saying you want more people on there. Well, does it not then stand to reason that the the consideration of existing cycling data is irrelevant along a corridor, but yet you've included that data in the pack for us? Do you, understand, do you understand what I'm saying? Councillor Donovan asked a question and you said yes. Through the chair, that, the question is? That, well, my, my question is, what is the relevance of including the existing data then? Because I've, I, I've factored that into some of my considerations. You know, let's say you double the cyclists, but you halve the cars. If you want to talk about moving people around the city. Um, but per Councillor Donovan's... Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, I just don't understand the relevance. If the, if the usage of the corridor as it stands is, is redundant because you're fundamentally changing how people use it, then what, what is the relevance of it on there? How is this informing the decision making? Uh, if I'm not using the data correctly, I want to know how to use it correctly. Um, through, through the chair, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I think it's what we're trying to uh, show or trace through that information is that if you provide a separated bikeway, users will come and it, it usually doubles over time. 
Uh, answered your question. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Martin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Ho. Oh, I have a question first. Though, like, since the dogback design released to the public, have you received much complaints? I'll oh, show you too. Have much complaints received about the dogback? Sorry, design? what was yes. the question? Yes. Sorry, well, can I, I have a question it. again, Councillor Ho? Sorry. <clears throat> My apologies. Since the design of the dog lab of the bikeways have have the council received much complaints from our ratepayers? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Through the chair, we haven't yeah. undertaken an extensive consultation with regard to the new route, and that is one of the issues, obviously, at the moment. As we design, we will be doing some iterative con consultation. So, okay. Yeah. So can, the answer is no. Can make some comments, chair? No, we, no, we can only ask questions. I've allowed a lot of commentary. Okay. But for you, Councillor Ho, you may. Okay, all right, thanks, Chair. Well, it's because, like, I mean, had a really bad head there, wasn't going to speak, but since Councillor Moran tried to speak on my behalf, I, I think maybe I should, you know, speak up for myself. <laughs> really, I mean, as the CEO mentioned, Just the project has been not... into uh, a decision. It's not no, a decision no, making. No, no, no. Well, I mean, as the CEO mentioned, that the project has been on the pipeline for quite some time, and I would rather um, remind members that like, when government do projects, it's not just about economic benefits, but also social benefits. I mean, we can't keep talking about how many car parts we lost and how much business we lost, blah, 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 blah. You know, the project is in line with our strategic plan, right? It, I, 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 I'm not sure whether or not we should keep discussing whether or not we should discuss should we have the byway or not. I think we should discuss how we actually pick the best route to do the byways and mm. and do it on the right time before mm. the money run out. All right? I think that is the, that is something that we should talk about. It's not about whether or not we should have. It. Okay. Well, I just thank you, Councillor. We've got to work out where where. Oh, I'm going to actually. Um, Take no more questions. Yeah. Um, but I do have a few of my own, if that's okay. Um, I would just uh, like to um, talk about the church that is on the street. Chair, you, don't you meet with the administration as chair before to ask your questions? No. 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 You, well, you said that you wouldn't speak to the chair as a previous I have a question, though. I just have a question. No, I'm allowed to ask a question <laughs> in regards to the matter. I have clarified that. If you have an open route to the staff when they set the agenda for your committees. I, I can. It's I, unheard of to. Apparently, um, according to governance, I can ask. I cannot, I'm not going to enter in any debate with any thought. I just want to um, ask a question in regards to the church on Franklin Street because I have received, uh, I have been communicated in regards to it, in regards to what uh, the loss of car parks will be to the church, the use of the church on the street close by, or the Greek Orthodox Church. Through the chair, Dan, have we put the information to hand? Uh, through the chair, um, the indication of the utilisation um, says that we'll be losing around eight, uh, 60 to 80 car parks in that street segment. So directly in front of the church, there's probably likely to be around 10 to 50 parks, um, of which there may be some impacted as part of the proposed design. What we have considered and looked at um, uh, today, uh, the question is how much available capacity is in the block or in the, in the local area, and then we believe that there's enough capacity to take up that um, demand in the neighbouring uh, uh, block or side streets or behind block. Understanding obviously that there is impact with elderly people um, attending church. Thank you. At the end of this matter, if anyone has got any more questions, no, uh, if it, if for tonight, uh, if anyone's got any further questions or like further clarifications, um, please take that offline prior to the meeting, Councillor Sims. Thank you, Ed Chief. Could I suggest we maybe have a short recess just to give people an opportunity to um, have a bite to eat and refresh? Is everyone in agreement <laughs> with this? No, I think we should keep going. Um, We're nearly there. Well, we've got a lot to get through. <laughs> Can I have a show of hands who would like to take a break? Everyone's no, 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 no. 
I'm sorry. We, we are going to have to break. We're not going to be able to finish it. All right, why don't, why don't we just go for another 15 minutes and let's see how we go the next item and then we'll go from there. Okay? Yeah, well, that's fine. I was conscious of the staff as well. I might want to have a bite to eat. Exactly. Yeah, so why don't you bring item 5 1? Why don't you bring item 5 1? If you're not going to waste our time. Uh, you're an expert on that. <laughs> Where's your yeah. housing koala sanctuary going? The EOI is going through. Actually, Rob, I know right, the three policy. Members, we're actually going to stick to the procedure of this committee meeting, and that is questions go through the chair and then they will be answered. You will stick to that format. You do not control this room, I control this room. So you stick to the format of the committee. Are we correct? Are we? No. Okay. Yep. Agreed. Great. <laughs> Item 5.1. Anne was out of the room. When you said <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite happy, happy to repeat myself. Um, okay, now we're going to item 5.1. Um, we have the free public transport tickets. So, <coughs> any questions? <laughs> Councillor Hyde. Yeah, so um, looking at the report, I'm gathering that the administration believes that no aspect of such a scheme would be financially viable. Is that is that correct? So not even because I noticed there are a few there are a few different options and scenarios canvassed, but the, the recommendation has come back just to note the report. So so none of them would be financially viable or worthwhile conducting. That's a question, CEO. Through the chair, Pat. Uh, through the chair, the report um, it it's quite um, hard to put a measure against a lot of the options that we consider. Um, feasibility is one consideration of it. Um, obviously, there's an incentive scheme that council could could consider around this um, as a financial contribution in effect. But how we measure success is quite difficult. Um, so, uh, from that perspective, the report has been drafted by like us. And um, through the chair. So, so chair, in the order of two to three million dollars per week, when you're talking about estimated ticket revenue. Um, so, did you unpack that to look at who's buying those tickets, what they're doing, in in order to understand um, what then those people would be coming into the city for? <laughs> Uh, through the chair, that, that relates to uh, approximately 550,000 uh, tickets um, being utilised across all different public transport uh, modes. What, because we don't have end of trip um, off, uh, we're not actually sure whether those tickets progress through the city to Goula uh, or whether they actually land in the destination. So, so, sorry, Chair, I can't hear the answer to the question. Miss, can we please stop um, the talking? And so, the so we, we don't actually have a firm figure on on how many end up here in the city from from analysing the, the, the ticket data. I know you've got rough figures on commuters and stuff. But yeah, through, through the chair, the actual um, ability to measure who actually lands in the city um, based on the current metro uh, ticketing system is impossible mm -hmm. to determine. So all we can work on is the census data to yep. determine how many people are using public transport to get to a transit. Right, so it's using the census data. Okay. Um, Thank you, Councillor. All right. I, I think that answers it, all your all questions. My questions. Thank you moment. very much. Anyone else have any questions? Councillor Martin. Just a really quick one. Uh, and my question is pretty much in substance of what Councillor Hyde was asking. One of those ideas that is providing free public transport associated with the city of Adelaide and seemed to me to be quite sensible. What, why are we not exploring that? Why is that not notes the report and ask the administration to explore further? Of all of the options, that seemed to be the one that was the easiest to do. See ya. Matt, can you respond? Uh, through the chair, uh, generally the events provided by the city of Adelaide aren't ticketed. So to be able to, again, uh, administer a fund that doesn't have a ticket that has a free ticket attached to it, um, it's hard to administer. So that, in effect, somebody could, um, well, there would be no ticket to purchase, I suppose. You would have to, uh, 
there, there is no way of actually putting a ticket or a free ticket to an event that doesn't have a, a ticket. I, I do understand that that may be the case with many things, but for example, uh, the Lord Mayor's Gala Christmas event is occurring in the next seven days, the gala concert, uh, for which uh, there are tickets provided through a ticketing agency. Why wouldn't we provide transport associated with that? If, and there are tickets associated with that. Why can't we do that where we ticket events? And there are several through the year, including organ recitals and the like that we do. Yeah. Uh, through those events that there is potentially a, a ticket, um, people could take up the option of that and it would be funded through council, but there's no um, data to say that that ticket would be utilised, which would be forking um, that, that expense. So again, hard to administer with a measure on how much utilisation that would share. Anyone else with questions on this item? Councillor Hyde, you've already asked some questions. So is it- Thank you for the, for the uh, supplementary question. Um, how long, there's nothing in the report to indicate the amount of time the administration spent in preparing this report. I know it's highly detailed. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do we have <laughs> either direct definition? What has this got to do with the questions for this report? And I, want to know, I want to know how much time was sunk into this document. Well, you can ask that offline. It's pretty relevant. Well, I just believe that at this moment, actually, I just want to stick to the subject matter and asking questions in regards to the subject matter. I do not want to veer off. I do not want to have a discussion leering into another direction. Well, Cal I want to it's a meeting. very simple question. They can either take it on notice or they can answer it right now. Or Deputy Lord Mayor, um, I'm not taking that question. You can take it offline. offline. Thank you. Um, any other questions? No? Thank you. Next item. Uh, 5.3. Oh, sorry. 5.3. Sorry. Um, the Melbourne Station Crossing. So any questions? Councillor Martin. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, and thank you very much to the administration for this. But um, when we say it's going to be added to the list at 11. Um, how long is that list? And when is it likely that we might actually see the crossing? 2030. 30 years. 30 years? I'm sorry. It'll be long gone. Okay, was that a question, Councillor Martin? Yeah, well, the administration says clearly that it will be considered and prioritised against other projects in the budgeting process. I'm asking directly, what does that mean in terms of time? I see ya. Uh, through the chair, if the um, if the recommendation is um, uh, approved and endorsed by council next week, then um, it would uh, go together with a few other emerging priorities that we do have, councillor. Um, new and and um, upgraded infrastructure is obviously um, being prioritised behind asset renewals at the moment. So there is a list of projects that Council has um, on its books that we are currently prioritising and this would be in with those. Thank you. Any other questions in regards to the matter, uh, to the subject? Thank you. Okay, members, any questions in regards to this matter? Council Hyde. Yeah, um, one of the concerns raised at Apple by me um, was that uh, the uh, noise report that was prepared only took into account um, the noise made by players on the field as opposed by spectators and other users. It appears that there hasn't been a fresh report done. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. Oh. It is still correct. Okay. <laughs> and and is, that, is that standard for us to, to operate on that basis? I mean, this is the first time I've seen such a report with such a noise report consideration in it, and I don't know what best practice is, so. Uh, through, through, yeah. 
Um, yes, I did. If I could just comment on it. Um, my understanding was that the request was um, the impact of the noise from within the building, and that's the piece of work uh, that we commissioned, rather than noise from spectators outside of the building. No, my, my read of the report was actually that it's it's predicated on two football teams on the field, not not so much the noise, unless I'm misreading that. I thought it, it added up the players and that's what it came to. I see you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, to the chair, so the noise assessment was based on people inside the building, not outside. So no one outside. No. To doors, the chair, that's correct. Doors closed, doors open. Mm -hmm. uh, I will see you. Right. <laughs> Uh, I would have to check the actual assessment. I, it's just taking it from a comparison point of view of um, the building being in one location compared to the building being in the other location. So the setting would be the same, the doors are open or closed. Right. It was to get a comparison of those two locations and those noise levels. And it was, a, it was a chain of two or three decibels, remember? Yeah, through the chair, that's correct. Yes, it was roughly two decibels maximum difference. All right. Oh. What would <laughs> any other questions what, what, through the what, chair? What would, what would chair or chair, if you could please advise me, what would the capacity of a 375 square meter facility be, and also what would the capacity uh, of a 410 square meter facility be, noting the community space in there? Yeah. Thanks, Roy. Uh, through the chair again just to be consistent we just looked at two football teams we didn't yeah no, but so I was, i'm just wondering how many people so then i can think about how far off the mark we are uh, through the chair if i could direct members to page um, 19 um, and it shows that there were uh, the current building location as approved by council 44 persons poc proposed location 44 persons so um yeah. Modeling. Yeah, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. The, the question is, I, I understand the modeling that was done on the 44 persons. I'm curious as to how many other persons uh, could fit in to uh, the facility, Through the which would then give me an indication okay, sorry, of how reliable the 44 persons is. If it's if you've calculated 44, but they're in actual fact they have 150 in there. But if it's you know, only 60 or 70, then it's a lot closer. Ray, can you help? Yeah, through the chair, we were looking for what is a consistent figure, and that would be on a regular training night. It would be the equivalent of two teams without any spectators. Because um, that would be the most late night activities, would be during weeknights, training nights. Yeah. Uh, doesn't really answer it, but I'll look. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Martin. Um, yes, a uh, question for the administration. Is Park 9 the only park that is leased by PAC of Collegians? Mm -hmm. See right, yeah, Through the chair, um, the old Collegians don't lease any parks. Well, let me rephrase that. How many parks are leased by PAC on behalf of old Collegians? Yeah, through yes. chair one. There's no other parkland in the parklands that is touched by PAC. Uh, oh, okay. Through the chair, PAC, yes, but the old collegians, no. So um, if there is another park, uh, a piece of parkland that is leased by PAC, does it allow the old collegians to use it? Laura, <laughs> Through the chair, thank you. It would be completely up to PAC and their programming at the time. Okay, oh, it's just that I understand that PAC or Collegian Soccer uses a, another park uh, in the South Parklands. Is that not correct? Am I misinformed? Park 15. Right? Park 15, yeah. Mm -hmm. Through chair, so that would be through a sub lease arrangement. So okay. PAC hold a lease. No, that's all right. It just took a long time to get there. Okay. So, um, why wouldn't uh, in Park 15, when there is no residential amenity issue at stake, why would we not encourage PAC Old Collegians to think about Park 15, whether that's through PAC or directly with PAC Old Collegians, rather than a circumstance where we're putting club rooms in the middle of a residential area? Is that a question 
That's Perhaps a question. Not. Why wouldn't why wouldn't well, we consider? That's a question for the CEO. It, it's a question for whoever would like to answer it. <laughs> through the chair. Uh, through chair. Um, yes, they could look at locating part 15. That is a much smaller oval, so it would have um, a significant impact on trees in that park. Mm -hmm. To get a same size oval to what they currently have in park nine. Okay. Um, now we know that PAC uh, old collegians had club rooms at 245 the parade Beulah Park and those premises were licensed and the premises were sold and the license returned. Do we know why that happened? Uh, we would have no knowledge and no record of that. Not okay. a all right, um, well, let me ask some licensing question. As we know, hotels and restaurants and the like rely on sporting clubs uh, after matches for patronage and PAC Old Collegians relied on, according to their website, the Hackney Hotel, the General Havelock, uh, the Alma, and now it doesn't say where they go for their drinking. Do we know which is the hotel that is patronised by PAC and which will lose their business? Again, that's another question I don't think administration will be able to answer, Councillor Martin. All right. Well, let me ask one that they might be able to answer. Um, the Old Collegians currently have a liquor licence for Park 9. Um, how many people is that licence for? And Council has to be a signatory to that. How many people is that licence for? All right, can you answer? Well, look, I can help. It's 350. Um, could the administration tell me why we're measuring noise for 44 people when the liquor licence allows for 350 people to be on Park 9 consuming alcohol? Can we have that? Uh, can, can you answer that now? Yeah. Yeah, that's really chair. So the assessment was based on the building, not the spectators around the oval, because no matter where the building would be, the spectators in the oval would not change location. Okay, then if there is to be a new club room built on Park 9 with a liquor license, which is contemplated in all of the documentation, would it be the administration's intention to allow the existing liquor license for 350 people to continue, or would it intervene and reduce the numbers associated with that liquor license? Is there something you can answer now? Thanks, Laura. Thank you, through the chair. So the existing legal licence that they have for 350 people is for special events are actually held at Park Nine. So they are days that they've quarantined for ladies days. And at the moment they don't have the space to have those events in silence simply because they are chamber facilities. The 350 people allowance is for people to circulate around the ovals. As part of that plan, they have areas quarantined and marketed out for the event, essentially. Um, with the new building, it would be on the assumption that if they applied for a liquor licence, if it's something that the lease agreement uh, approved and it was supported through the CLMP, then it would require the consent of council prior to lodging that with the commissioner. Um, and, and so therefore, would it be correct to assume that PAC would seek to extend its existing license? Is that our expectation, that they will seek 350 people? And the liquor license is part of the lease arrangement, so I'm not asking something that the administration hasn't contemplated. Laura, thank you. Thank you, through the chair. Um, with the new building, I would suspect that they would be applying for a liquor license the building and whatever capacity that building could actually hold. The building, I would not suggest to hold 350 people in it. I would suspect that if they were continuing to have ladies' days or their special events throughout the year, that they would be individual applications back into council through, an, through a small event licence. And can I ask the administration whether the lease with the liquor licence contemplates that alcohol will be served, uh, thanks to Councillor Hyde's amendment, um, not only two hours after the conclusion of all matches, that's last drinks two hours after the matches, but whether that will also apply to training nights as well. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Um, we would need to consider that application when it arrived with us. Generally speaking, when we consider those types of applications, it would be against whatever the permitted use is. And, and given that uh, drinks will be allowed at the facility, 
last drinks two hours after stumps or uh, the last uh, siren or um, after training concludes. Um, in addition, how many nights a year is the administration, administration prepared to accept for other events, including ladies' nights, chalk raffles, whatever else they have? May I help um, in this matter? Um, I believe in the uh, liquor licensing would have to come through, if they're reapplying, they would have to come through council, and this will be um, able to be discussed. Is that, it yeah, can we just clarify the process? Just so uh, can I just uh, clarify with the chair? That is not the case. Is it not does not come to the elected sorry. body, it comes right. to the administration. Okay, I was just informed. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, please answer the question. Mr. Chair, if I could just clarify a point around the permitted use in the two hours, it would still be on the condition uh, that it's concluding no later than the times stated in item seven of the lease agreement. So on a training night, they wouldn't be able to exceed their training time, whether they finished 15 minutes before training, uh, before that time. Sorry, seven again, I misunderstood. So the, we've put a condition of two hours following a sporting event, but it can be no later than the times that are stated in um, item seven of the lease agreement so those times means so for example if you were training to eight o'clock at night um, and the time shut off is 8 30 then they could only have a drink for half an hour so, uh, okay so i am understanding from the administration that alcohol will be served after training that is with this distinction that last drinks will be 8 30 on training nights if training finishes at eight. So, sorry, Fritjof, that, that's actually not what he said, Councillor Martin. He said if they were to do that, they can't go past the hours that are in the agreement. Uh, and that's what I'm asking. Is that likely to be part of the agreement? Because the liquor licence is a very substantial part of the lease. Uh, and therefore, I'm asking the administration, um, and it's silent on this in the documentation, which is why I'm asking the question, will liquor be sold after training nights and other events? Can this be? Yes. Sorry, see ya. Thanks, Ron. So through the chair, currently their um, liquor license is only for Saturdays, and so we'd expect to, um, that would get, run that same course. Um, can I ask the administration would expect or would insist? Thank you. Through the chair. So the way the uh, liquor licence clause is drafted within the lease agreement, they are required to seek the consent of council. So it is no alcohol unless they have the consent of council prior to lodging with CBS for their application. Uh, I do understand that and that's why I'm asking, yes. is it council's intention to insist or to grant a request to allow the consumption of alcohol after training and similar events outside of match days, where we know from Councillor Hyde's amendment that it, the last drinks will be two hours after the final siren or stumps? That's good, Chair. Um, we want this to be status quo in relation to their liquor license, so we would anticipate and we would um, require them to adhere to what current term practices are, which is the same day. Okay, no, that's a good, good answer. I'm happy with that. And just one final question. Um, is the administration aware uh, of whether this old collegians football club pays coaches and players? And if it did pay coaches and players, that is a fee for participating in sports, would that change any aspect of this license application? Uh, uh, that is the license application and the lease application. Yeah. We wouldn't know that, sorry. Would we ask that? Right? Yeah, through the chair. Um, that is something that does happen in community sport at all layers of sport. Um, that players sometimes get paid to play um, and sometimes they. Um, Thank you. Through the chair, just some additional information to that. Under the Parkland policy for leasing, educational institutions are granted a discount, which is a predetermined fee based on the square metre. The old collegiates will actually be a sub-licence holder, so it will be for PAC to manage that arrangement. 
So the, 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 the rental fee that they pay to council for that land and the licence fee for the oval that they pay to council is not determined by the payment that a club grants to a coach or a player in that circumstance. But that's a question and therefore a sub-question to that is, should we actually be reviewing our policy in relation to parklands, leases and licences where we know users are participating in paid sporting? If indeed this is the case. Well, that's not what we're discussing here. We're discussing. No, no, again, we are. This is, this um, is no, we're, exactly we're what we're discussing. talking about the um, about a different matter altogether. So, if this is something Sorry. that you want to bring forward, Councillor Martin, in in other ways, you you are most welcome to. So, members, any other questions? Yes. Um, so we are going to have a 10 minute break. Is that okay with us? Oh, half an hour. You want half an hour? Half an hour? Yeah. Half an hour? Yeah. Half an hour? So back at 8.15? Everyone? Okay. Are you all happy with that? Thank you. We're happy.
for the remainder of the items. Um, direct questions to the chair um, and please do not enter in any debate and no extra commentary. So let's keep this meeting tight. I've been, uh, I've been here long enough. They waited for half an hour for us to have their meal, for us to have our meal. Um, so I think we just need to keep this meeting going. I didn't get it correct. Thank you. Um, okay, item 5.5. Uh, any questions in regards to this item? <laughs> Councillor Martin. Um, yeah, look, um, can I just preface what I'm saying by saying I, I am a supporter of these. But um, I, I note that at uh, paragraph 22, as you've done, uh, Chair, um, one, two, three, and four, 22.1.2.3.4, <laughs> Um, Apple and Mitt uh, considered this report in much more detail uh, than we are um, and interrogated uh, our administration at length and then came to the considered view that it supported the application too, um, but um, proposed a reduced bump in, recommended that the footprint for the event be limited to a single zone rather than the sprawling zone, which um, is currently proposed in the plan, which is not uh, supplied or not in the documents, it's in the link. Um, and uh, additionally, that uh, illuminate explore options for significantly reducing the amount and impact of fencing, because there's a substantial amount of fencing in the southern part of the zone. And then that eliminate explores options to reduce the bumping and bump out, which is a month, I think, uh, in each case. So given that Apple has gone to so much trouble, is our principal advisor, um, why is that not reflected in the recommendation to council? See ya. Christy, can you Thank you, through the chair. We have uh, proposed to you that uh, that is part of their, uh, we've actually included that, obviously, for your consideration as part of the consultation. We've proposed to you the same um, proposal that we have put up to our club for consideration. I guess my question is, if our principal policy advisor says to council, this is the way it should be, shouldn't that be incorporated in the recommendation of council? Or does it have to be amended to reflect what Apple's views are? Correct. Uh, through the chair, so um, it depends on timeframes associated with sign off of reports. Um, so um, uh, what we try to do is make sure there's sufficient gap between Apple's advice, take that back to the event organiser, work with the event organiser to try and accommodate as much as possible Apple's advice and then bring a separate report into committee and council for decision. Um, in this instance, uh, due to timeframes associated with the event organiser, we haven't been able to um, fully negotiate with the event organiser all of Apple's requirements. So, so the following paragraph um, sort of explains that. So it's up to council now um, to um, help shape what that looks like from a decision-making perspective. It was important for the event organiser to try and get a council uh, resolution um, this um, by Christmas. Okay, now, um, since sign up on this agenda, um, almost a week has passed, what have the negotiations with the event organiser on those four points that have been raised yielded? Thanks, Tony. Uh, through the presiding member, um, following APLA, we have met with the event organisers um, and they have certainly committed to looking at the bump in and bump out um, and reducing the amount of time that it will take to build that. Um, and they are also committed to looking at uh, removing the second section, which was on the eastern side of the square, to incorporate it within the entire footprint. 
um, and they have also, um, as explained to APLA, uh, have agreed with the commentary that was provided to APLA that the fencing will be limited and will also meet high design um, aesthetics. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, no, me. You had no. You're right. No. Let's see. We'll move on to item uh, 5.6 again, uh, Christy. Any questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, 5.6. Yes. Oh dear. I'm going to need a moment. Um, through the chair, that was a, a separate distribution to mm. members. Is that the program? Yes, the yeah. Royal Crow yeah. Day Club. Oh, okay. 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 Any questions? Members? No, as long as I don't go to China, it's all fine. No, no questions? Uh, I, I just... Can, I, can we come back to this? Because I don't have it in front of me and I haven't refreshed this. You would like to come back to this item? Yeah. Tonight? Can. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, can I do that too? There's a few I'd like to do. I, I, so uh, even if we just go to five seconds. Just one moment, can I ask a vice administration? I just don't even have it in front of me because it wasn't in there. At this point, we'll just keep moving, Councillor Hyde. Um, 5.7. So that's the end of 5.6? That's the end of 5.6. Forevermore. Forevermore. Okay. 5.7, any questions in regards to this matter? No? Uh, yes. So, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, you went up first. Lord Mayor? I sort of, uh, uh, along with a few others, I was just trying to get the report up. Um, I do actually have questions of 5.6. I'm just wondering whether you'll accept the questions. Oh, OK, okay. considering, considering um, we have the item 5.7 coming up, is that right? Let's, we'll go through this first and then we'll, um, may come back to 5.6. Yeah, staff, would you mind staying here and go through this item? Oh, hang on, let's see what's standing so, you can say no, that's fine. I can ask the question later. But just one moment, I'll just take some advice. Okay, considering that um, we have the staff here at the moment, I'm really sorry. Can we go back to item 5.6? Very sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So now everyone has got their papers on 5.6. Are we clear that we are on 5.6? Yes. Any questions in relation to it? Lord Mayor. Thank you. And thank you for going back to it. I just was having trouble getting it up on my um, uh, iPad. Um, Mark, I just have one question and that is around the hours of operation. Um, I know that uh, to address the feedback and the consultation that the uh, operation is to 10 p.m. each night. Um, my, let's say my experience of a uh, fringe festival is that normally there's a nine o'clock show, so it's a staggering of shows. And in this instance, they'll have to stagger their shows more because they have to do their um, cleansing and their COVID um, uh, plans in between times. Um, have you had a discussion with them around what a 10 o'clock closing of operation might do in terms of affecting their schedule of performances, et cetera? Uh, through the presiding member, yes, we have had that discussion with them and their feedback to us um, is that it won't be financially uh, viable for them to operate if the hours are kept at 10 p.m. Could you remind me what they had put forward? It was midnight, wasn't it? Was it? Through the presiding member, it was 11 p.m. during the weekday and up to midnight, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of the public holiday. Thank you. Councillor Hyde, do you want to ask your question now? Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, and, and thank you for the report. It's quite thorough, um, uh, and I think it's I think it's a very good report. Um, but I'm just curious about impact on business and 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 what impact on a bricks and mortar business this event will have that the previous one didn't have or had more of or you know the differences between such so I know that there's less people expected um, uh, through the door is the offering markedly different to the previous iterations in Victoria Square <clears throat> thanks man uh, through the presiding member yes the offering is uh, substantially different to what we have previously previously seen in Victoria Square uh, the previous Royal Croquet Club occupied both the south and north side of the square and they closed uh, Reconciliation Plaza on the weekends and their capacity was 10,000. They're now proposing to utilise um, the southern side with a 3,000 capacity, but obviously that is subjected to health and the COVID uh, restrictions that may be in place at the time. Their programming is also substantially different. Um, they had multiple um, venues and also a, a large main concert um, stage where they had um, international and national acts perform with each of those concerts holding between six to 8,000 people. Um, this time they've got an open air area, they're proposing an open air area called the Stables with a maximum of 1,000 seats, um, two smaller stages on the eastern side with a maximum capacity of around 500. Um, and then also on the western side, an interactive um, enclosed light and sound installation. Thank you. Um, through the chair, uh, uh, anecdotally, I, I understood that um, a lot of the people that used to go to the RCC, it's sort of like a black hole. People would go there and they would stay there. Um, people that would otherwise be going to bars, clubs, mm -hmm. Um, dance halls, discotheques, and what have you. Um, they would go there and they'd stay there the entire time. Do we? Do we? Do we have an understanding? Do we? Do we have an understanding of of sort of the the, the type of clientele that would be attracted to this as opposed to the first one? Do, even a qualitative sort of. I'm trying, I'm trying to paint a picture of, of whether or not this will seriously adversely affect bricks and mortar businesses, whether it's an either or um, option for people or whether it's a, a value add to the city, because I'm struggling to see the value add so far. Members, can you please um, not talk during, excuse me, Councillor Sims? Sorry, Chair. Please. Apologies. Can you please answer that? It would help if I press the right button. Um, through the presiding members, so um, when the RCC first um, emerged as, as a fringe venue, um, the um, evidence and data um, that fringe um, provided to us was that um, the RCC uh, did attract a different audience to fringe shows. Um, the second highest ticket selling um, genre within Fringe is, is music related um, and so the RCC um, certainly um, provided um, a, you know, a, a new way of experiencing the Fringe. Um, in relation to um, the impact that has on bricks and mortar, um, I think anecdotally um, what we've understood from certainly the western part of the city and Councillor Sims moved a motion in his first term here as a council member to try and encourage um, more uh, fringe um, activity within the western part of the city um, because over the last few years um, certainly the eastern part of the city um, with the outdoor venues as well as the indoor venues uh, felt a big benefit financially um, from uh, uh, having the fringe and the western part of the city certainly provided feedback um, for a number of years to say that um, actually the fringe um, needed to expand um, over to the western side of the city. So um, in terms of uh, do we have data um, associated with the central market district and the impact that the RCC may or may not have on that, we don't have a hard data, um, just uh, feedback from uh, bricks and mortar businesses. 
understanding and, and of course the uh, I mean looking through the consultation results it's very clear that there are many hoteliers um, and uh, people from other stakeholders substantial stakeholders in the city um, I'm not seeing many comments in here in favor um, is, is that correct that there were 31 um, people that completed a submission on your site is that the total or is that yeah, and is that, is that across all of our modes of consultation, like you would have picked up any other comments that we may have received here and there? Uh, through the presiding member, yes, that's correct. Um, and also we uh, sent the information directly to uh, Adelaide Central Market, the Hilton and the surrounding areas. So uh, in addition to the YORSA as well, and um, RCC event organisers also have undertaken targeted um, engagement around that area as well. Interesting. Um, and just to understand, have, have the organisers of this event changed through the chair? And if so, how much? Are there still some familiar faces around or is it not a complete overhaul? Uh, through the presiding member, it is a completely new entity um, owned by a new director. Um, the creative director is still part of the um, organising um, body of um, RCC, however, is not um, a financial partner in that business. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I have item 5.7. Any question members? Yes, Councilman. Just one very quick one. And uh, look, it is a great document. And I particularly like, and ratepayers will like, 2.2 about the water smart system at uh, 149. But one of the recommendations is for a water play space. What is that? What, what's a water play space? Is that. I need to get my mind out of the gutter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so admin, answer the question, please. Thank you. Um, so, members, so through the chair, um, so uh, in terms of water play space, one of the things that um, we receive feedback on is the um, opportunity to use water for cooling in places that might be a temporary installation during periods of extreme heat. So, for example, in um, Run the wall. So that's the type of thing we're talking about, and we've had conversations with um, SA Water around those types of issues. So it's sort of the equivalent of putting a hose up and running under it on a hot day, basically. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 5.8. Are you sure? Thank you, members. Any questions to administration? Councillor Sims, any questions? No, thank you. No? All good? Yes, Councillor Martin. Um, yeah, yeah, this is the CLMPS, the general provisions, yeah. Uh, look, I, I should flag um, the context of the questions because it does uh, have many men. I actually agree with this, but I just would like a conversation about it. For example, I would like to know if we're going to agree to general principles that are enshrined for all um, parklands locations, what SAPOL thinks about a policy that is to light all pathways or as many as we can to encourage people to walk into the parklands at night? I mean, is that good advice? Um, have we asked them? Thanks, Michelle. Uh, through the chair. Um, no, we haven't consulted. We haven't consulted with St. Paul or any other external stakeholders at this stage. But the general um, parklands wide policy statements in the general provisions are more a starting point for each individual park 
um, management plan. So if um, lighting and safety is an issue for a particular park, we'll certainly um, shape the particular policy um, statement for that individual park to reflect that. So the general statements that are in this... Um, sorry, do you mind turning your microphone oh, on? sorry, I thought I did. Apologies. Um, so the general uh, policy statements in the um, general provisions, um, as I said, is really just a, um, a baseline, if you like, which is, um, um, yeah, as I said, as I've already said, to then sure. tailor it to individual parks and take that issue into account. And on what do we base, and I, I uh, prefix uh, this by saying, it, it, you know, I think it will be controversial, on what basis are we saying there are only three ways for dogs to go into the parklands. Uh, that's on a leash, um, which at page 176 says it must be two metres, no more, um, when most people have these days about 10 metres. Um, uh, not at all, uh, or alternatively sometimes uh, off the leash, but only in those areas. Uh, it, it just seems to me that this is really controversial and I'm interested to know to what extent that we've actually done any kind of consultation um, with parklands users and others before we incorporate this as a general principle, and that's what the heading is, general principles for community land management plans. Uh, CEO? Oh, that's that. through to the chair. Um, the two metre um, leash requirement that um, is part of our DOGS bylaw 2018, so there would have been consultation with the community undertaken with that at the time. But we'll be taking these general provisions out for community engagement. So we'll be looking for feedback from the community on what we've proposed with the dog on leash, off leash um, um, arrangements. And we'll be consulting extensively with um, key stakeholder groups in the dog community. And, and on what basis are we proposing that drones are banned from all but two parts? Uh, through the chair, I have to take that one on notice. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, I, I just wonder whether, you know, I, I do understand privacy issues, but these days there's this huge group of photographers who use drones for the purpose of taking photographs. And I can think of no better location than the parklands. So why would we stop people pursuing hobbies like that? Can we not be a bit, bit more fine grained about the policy rather than just saying no drones? Um, again, sorry, through the chair, um, I understand it's a uh, advice of um, CASA, CASA, Civil Aviation Safety Authority. Thank you. Um, I understand in Park um, 21 where they're allowed, um, we can't have informal use of, of drones and other aerial um, vehicles, um, but there are three or four groups which have the um, approval of CASA to use drones in those space. So I understand it must be just the landing aircraft and taking off aircraft issue, but um, as I said, I have to take that on notice to give you a better answer. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hyde? I just want the air con on. Oh. Is that a question? <laughs> Can we have the air con? Yes. Yeah, may, we, um, may we have the air con on, please, Chair? <laughs> sure. <laughs> really hot yeah, over yeah, this no, side of the room. All right, thank you. Uh, any other questions, members? No, thank you, thank you. Uh, item 5.9. Members, any questions? Anyone? Councillor Martin? Yeah, look, yes, the question is to the administration. Um, the substance of this motion that's proposed to go to council um, reflects uh, one of three scenarios put to a non-voting meeting of council on the 24th of November. Um, so this is not a policy of council. Um, this has come from somewhere. And I'm, I'm worried that the administration is basically taking the lead in this and saying to council, this is what you're going to do. The rates are going up, the charges are going up. We've lost faith in you. We're running the show. Uh, is that the case? 
That's a question. That's a very important question. Yeah. Through the chair, as you know, council makes the decisions, um, but without doubt, the administration is providing frank and fearless advice, and this is our advice. So, the administration put to council three scenarios and decided to choose one, uh, which I might add is splashed on the front page of the uh, the newspaper today. City rates poised to rise. Um, with consequent outrage from people who telephoned me. And this was all come from the administration, not from the elected body. That is correct. Um, so if the elected body doesn't agree with this, um, we're already wearing the bad publicity, clearly. Uh, that our only way of dealing with this is to vote it down at Tuesday's meeting at council. Is that correct? Yeah, through, through the chair, you can consider and decide upon whatever course of action you like. The administration is just trying to ensure you meet the requirements of the Local Government Act and that um, helping you to achieve, you know, um, and ensure financial sustainability during this difficult time. And um, you've heard from the independent members of our audit committee are of a similar view. So we're just simply providing to you the advice we think is appropriate at this time to ensure financially uh, we are sustainable. Okay, um, at 36, and you'll excuse me, I've lost my face momentarily. At 36, um, the administration proposes that there are to be cuts to services. That is, it's on the agenda. Um, which of course is uh, bad news again for ratepayers uh, who contacted me. Um, is the administration able to provide some sort of illumination as to what, in addition to the increase in rates, the increase in fees and charges, what the cut, those cuts will be? Uh, clearly, if you are pointing us in a direction for rate increases and fee charges, there must be something that underlines the request uh, or the, um, I guess, the adoption on our agenda of a review of services. So you're talking about clause 36? 36, 36 yeah, 36.1 through to 36.8. Okay. Um, through the chair, so under the surplus model that we presented to members um, at committee workshop, um, that would uh, see uh, services um, being reduced by, I think it's roughly six, six and a half million dollars. Is that correct, Sandra? Five point two. Sorry, five point two. Five point two million dollars. And does that include include cuts to services which have already occurred without our approval? For example, the closure of the North Adelaide Community Centre's um, fully attended community li liaison officer position and limited access now to the facility. Does that include that sort of thing? Uh, through the presiding member, no, it doesn't. And just to be clear, we're not proposing um, yeah. reducing um, the staffing levels at the North Adelaide Community Centre. What we're proposing is a different way of delivering the same level of service with a re one um, reduced headcount of FTE within a complement of around 90 within that program. Um, and uh, love the, I think when we shared with you the organisational structure, um, we did say that the $80 million that we think we have validated to date is still $2 million short of the $20 million council resolution um, and that we will come back to you in February with some options for council members to consider on a revived, revised service directory um, to show you what the services are, the FTE is associated with that, and ask for council's guidance and direction in relation to um, service um, cuts or different way of delivering services. So the path we're on, if I'm not mistaken, is that the administration wants us to increase rates by five point whatever it is, um, fees and charges by 7.9% and cut services by almost $6 million. $5 million. Five. 5.6, I thought. Is it 5.2? 5.2. 5.2. Anyone for 5.6? <laughs> <laughs> Going once? 
Yeah. Well, look, um, thank you for that. Um, I, I guess I will have more to say uh, at council when I can say something. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Hyde. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm just curious, so Councillor Martin's already highlighted that this came from the administration. I, I, I wish to know, is the recommendation in front of us consistent with any of the feedback provided in that workshop? From the elected members? See ya. Through, through the chair, I believe that there was um, varied feedback provided. Um, and I think the conversation was observed by the administration. Further to that, we considered the most appropriate response. And as your administration have provided you with our advice as to the best way forward. So yeah, I couldn't say that it was a consensus view of the of, of the workshop at all because we didn't get to that. Um, and in fact, that's not what workshops are about. Okay. I believe um, that the the idea that we provided you with all the information that we could, that we received advice from the independent members of the audit committee has led us to the point of providing you with this advice. But um, through you, Chair, uh, I'm just curious as to what no one, no one in that committee workshop suggested anything other than freeze. Some people didn't suggest anything. Most people suggested freeze. We've now gone with the complete other end of that scale. So, Chair, I'm, I'm just curious as to we could have had the advice from the audit committee at any point in time. They're available to the administration. I'm just trying to understand what the point of that workshop was if none of this feedback that we gave regarding the development site rating policy or regarding the special discretionary rebate or regarding the state of our fees and charges was taken on board and we went straight for the uh, for the uh, super surplus option. Um, was anything taken on board from that workshop? Did it achieve anything? Uh, there's certainly, sorry, there was information that, that went this way, but it does not appear that there was information that went that way. Um, so through the chair, um, as we were very clear last week um, with regards to the rating policy, that will come through next year's business plan and budget, but in line with um, the council decision, sorry, motion on notice to address one specific component of that. Um, we have addressed that in this report. The rest of the rating policy will come through um, workshops and um, feedback with council um, over the coming months while we work with you to build a budget for the next financial year. Right, okay. Um, and uh, I, I wish to know from the administration, um, noting, noting that governments across Australia and the world are now operating with deficits, operational deficits. Um, they've gone into massive amounts of debt. How does how does your super surplus option at the expense of our ratepayers compare with similar governments? The capital cities, governments with a leading role in their communities. Um, so th through the chair, what I what I would say is um, a funding deficit, i.e. an increase in borrowings is perfectly acceptable. Um, we did work with you to lift our treasury policy um, earlier this year to make sure there was sufficient flexibility for council um, to um, borrow the required funds to deliver whatever is required, either from a COVID perspective or from an investment perspective to enable um, projects in the city to proceed. An operating deficit is different to a funding deficit. What we're trying to do is make sure that your income and expenditure um, is um, appropriate and that um, further um, down the track, you're able to repay um, what you borrow. That's the um, important part of what we're proposing. Mm. And so uh, through you, Chair, the, the status quo, as it were, or the status quo before whatever happens at Tuesday, is that we're returning to surplus in 26-27. Um, so I'm looking at the freeze option. Uh, then subsequently we're dropping to 1.8, up to 5.6, and then down to, to, to a $600,000 um, uh, negative for our operating position. 
what what are the assumptions now i know this is a long way away but the administration is actually asking us to make a decision on this budget based on uh, things such as you know breeding breaching our net financial liabilities target in 2031 so if you're going to ask me to make a decision based on assumptions running for 10 years which will fundamentally change um I, i'm wanting to know uh, why we bump up to surplus and then bump back down to a deficit, if, if I may, Chair. Through the Chair, the, um, the fluctuations depending on obviously market conditions, etc. at the time. So the freeze scenario that was presented assumes a freeze for one year only. So that would assume a freeze for 21-22. Beyond then, we would go back to the assumptions, which is CPI of 1.25 to 2% and interest rates of 1.3 to 2 Okay, and that's affecting your cost, but you're still operating. So when, I, when I'm looking at the slideshow that you presented, LTFP scenario three, and I'm tracking this all out, and you're still predicting freezing rates for for the entirety of that period. That was the assumption based on that, yeah? Through the chair, the assumption within rates is that the increase will be through either an increase in property valuations yep. and or a change in the rate in the dollar. So the rate in the dollar would only be a factor where property valuations have not increased with line with CPI. Right. Right. So, so, so really, your long term long term financial plan is not actually based on keeping the rate in the dollar flat as it were right now, and it's never been. Correct. Correct. So when I looked at LTFP last year, the year before, you were always factoring in rate rises. Correct, in line with CPI. So where property valuations do not increase in line with CPI, then rate in dollar is a factor in which you can leverage to increase your rate. And what has the difference been in recent years of those figures then? How, I mean, how much trust can I have in this long-term financial plan? If it's almost been <laughs> the, the length of one long-term financial plan that we've had the, the rating free. So I'm wanting to know what, how reliable is that figure and what has the difference between the it's an individual choice. We make that decision. I, 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 I'm well aware, I'm well aware, but I would have thought it was factored into the fundamentals now. Why would it be? The question is to administration. Sorry. Can you clarify that question again? So, so, so you're, you're factoring in a rise in rate revenue at CPI for your long-term financial plan, and you have been, right? But it doesn't hit CPI, or rarely hits CPI, is that, is that correct? Uh, can we have that answer, please? Um, Through the chair, the cumulative impact over the last seven years of freezing the rates, where the rate in the dollar has, where property valuations have not increased in line with CPI, is sixteen million dollars. Is sixteen million dollars. So, so what is the average? So you, you're you yeah, you're basing so you're basing all these assumptions on a two point eight percent increase. But what has been the average increase in recent years? Like how how far off if? Is it because I, I mean I'm looking at it and you, I mean you're factoring in what one one point five due to property valuations? It's one moment for it and answer that question. Certainly, certainly. I'll probably take that one and just get back to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, just a couple more questions in. The jump from 21-22 to 22-23, uh, we've got uh, 92, uh, no, that's a percentage. So it's $92 million worth of borrowings this financial year. Skip that, that just through your chair. Alex, which page are you on? Oh, I'm actually on the, I'm actually looking at the scenarios we're giving in the workshop. Oh, okay. um, and on that, I'm on page 54. I found it more useful for comparing given we're actually being asked to make decisions. Please ask uh, the questions through the chat. Yeah, the, the question the question is, um, we jump from $92 million to $119.4 million um, from 21-22 to 22-23. Uh, our operating position has us uh, losing seven mil. What makes up the other 21 odd million dollars in that financial year or the, between the two? Just one moment. 
through the chair, the um, the cash flow and the operating position are different. So the cash flow position has the incorporates any capital expenditure. So we've got large capital expenditure funded for 21-22, including new and upgrades, significant upgraded projects. So 19 so million. What's, that. Yeah, what sort of projects? So through the chair, the projects are we've got 20 million dollars worth of renewals factored in, yep. and we've got 19.2 million worth of new and significant upgrade. Part of that includes the Central Market Arcade redevelopment. Central Market Arcade redevelopment, which leads me um, to to another important question um, regarding asset recycling uh, and the strategic property action plan. Is I'm assuming in all of our various long-term financial plans, are there any are there any um, uh, assets considered in those plans that uh, may be uh, repurposed, recycled, liquidated, and then contribute. Um, and I'm not looking for particular assets, but I am looking for an understanding of how much, if any, is factored into either the long-term financial plan in front of us now, or the three long-term financial plans that we were presented with at the last committee meeting. I'm not looking to trip you up or ask you to or ask you to breach confidence, but I, I, I'm trying to verify the veracity of, of, of this long-term financial plan in front of me and the factors that go into making it so that I can make an informed decision. Okay. Thanks. Um, Thanks, Ian. Uh, back through the chair. Thanks for the question. I might just take this in parts. So I'll get Nicole and talk to the actual numbers, but I think for certainly the two and a half, three years I've been here, we've been talking to elected members about how we sweat our balance sheet a lot harder. It's been a reasonably healthy balance sheet, but it's a lazy balance sheet in my view. Um, we've done a, a, a deep dive into about um, 30 assets that we've prioritised amongst different asset classes across the CBD. Um, we are obviously looking at, um, pardon me, an item later on this, this evening, um, which um, we'd like to, to have a discussion in confidence given the commercial nature of some of the valuations, but we have a range of what I'd describe as low or non-performing assets, um, very low rates of return, very marginal as to why we were holding them. Some are locked in certain ways under certain um, conditions. Um, we look into divest some of those assets and reinvest in in what I'd call performing or revenue generating assets. And I would include the central market uh, development as one of those okay. because it will generate circa six and a half million bucks worth of uh, of rental revenue and about 1.5 in rates, and then you would be expecting um, some some capital uplift in that district as a result of that catalytic investment. So there's a there's an uplift. So um, we haven't quantified that uplift piece, but the other two yeah. give you a sense of the reinvestment yeah, strategy. Thank you. That makes thank sense. You. No, I, I understand all of that, but I want to know how much, notwithstanding, you know, certainly those assumptions of that uplift would be in the long term financial plan. I understand that they are. What I'm not understanding is assets over and above that, which uh, may be recycled, uh, what well, decisions as yet untaken. But is, are any of those are any of those factored in um, to our borrowings? Through the chair. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, through the chair, yes, they are. So if you refer to page 193 of tonight's agenda or within the uniform presentation of finances of any of the three scenarios. There is a loan add back proceeds from the sale of surplus assets. That is the reflective of the cash flow from the divestment. And that's so that's seven hundred and fifty-one thousand. Is that sorry? Within under the net outlays of new and upgraded assets, so it's further down. Oh right, okay. Um, oh, but okay. So the the only thing we're actually factoring into that is eighty-eight O'Connell in. 23, 24. <laughs> well, well, I'm assuming because that happens to be $25 million as well. So is, is that without wanting to breach confidence, is that correct? Or uh, through the chair, there are multiple assets. There within, are multiple assets within, within the long term financial plan. Right. But the only one that we're actually recycling is um, is a $25 million asset. OK, well, it's. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. Sorry, back to there. Just to clarify that, that's a grouping. That's not a, a, a set that's number a, of 25. Is 25? 25 is made up of, mo of multiple things that are going to contribute to that that number. Just to clarify, it's multiple assets that will be that are 
that are contained within that number. Within that, right, okay. But we'd be, presumably according to this, undertaking that activity and finalising those things. Wait, so is this saying, is this saying that we're going to receive 25 mil for each of those financial years, which means whatever whatever proceeds back from surplus assets, that's totaling $50 million over 23, 24 and 24, 25, is that correct? Through the chair? Through the chair, yes, that's correct. That's correct, okay. Can um, we um, move on to uh, another other members? So, sorry, just one, 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 one more? more question, one more question. Um, well then, how are our total borrowings, uh, I'm trying to mesh this together, how are our total borrowings only going down by 15 um, million from 23-24 to 24-25 if we're apparently uh, finding $50 million of unrealised value? Through the chair, is this based on the that's surplus the freeze, scenario? Well, that's the, the freeze, freeze scenario. scenario. Sorry. So part of that is the operating position. So the operating position reflects that. There is also significant investment required in our existing asset through renewals, and then there are other new and significant upgraded assets. Thank you. Okay. Thank Councillor you, Chair. Hi. Thank you, team. Uh, Councillor Sims. Well, thanks, yeah, Chair. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry to uh, have to break that up. Um, I've um, got a few questions around um, the uh, hardship provisions um, that are available. I understand there is a, um, a regime already that's um, in place, and I would assume that if uh, rates are increased, th those provisions would remain. Is there a um, mechanism to ramp that up um, in any way, and is that something that's been uh, considered um, in preparing the potential for a rate increase? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, to the chair. Uh, so the council does have a have a hardship policy. It's, I think it's actually led to legislation for us to have that. Um, and anybody and everyone is is able to apply for hardship, and we'll review those on on an application basis. Um, council through the COVID process approved on uh, an extended hardship uh, during COVID nineteen. Uh, which is for the Q4 and Q1 rates deferrals, which ends December this year, or this uh, this month. Um, absolutely, if you want us to revise the, those hardship conditions or extend them further, absolutely not a problem. Okay, I, I might have a chat with the administration offline around that one before um, the next meeting to see how that might um, how that might look. The the figure of um, four. $2 million worth of service uh, reductions. That's um, based on the assumption of uh, a rate increase as per um, this proposal. If the um, increase uh, wasn't to be implemented, has administration done modelling on the, the kind of service cuts that would then be required? Uh, through, through the chair, we've looked at those three scenarios, which was the, the freeze, the break even, and the um, surplus, and those are the models that we've, those are the, the scenarios that we've modeled. Um, if council wants to modify what we've recommended, uh, then we will remodel what that could look like. No, but what, I, what I'm council asking- Council can you please direct you? Oh, sorry, the chair. sorry, Chair. Um, what I'm um, asking is if we don't uh, increase fees, is there potential for there to be further service cuts? Through the chair, I think that's a real potential. Um, the quantum of them would need to work through. So the the uh, five um, point two million is probably the more conservative side in terms of uh, cuts to services, based on a, a modest increase in rates. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe that's correct. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kerr. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering if the administration has, has there been any view formed uh, within the administration or has there been any evidence uh, uh, looked at by the uh, administration as to whether um, the rates uh, paradigm uh, in this city uh, has an element of uh, commercial uh, businesses uh, subsidising residents? 
uh, in the amount of rates that are paid. Um, you're getting puzzled by that. Um, it's, it's not a, it's, again, it's not a trip question. It's just that, that we all know that the bulk of rates are paid by businesses. Uh, and the question is whether or not, is there any concern that there is a distortion uh, that might be present because uh, you know one square metre of commercial space is effectively a tax at a higher rate than one square metre of residential space. Is there any concern about that? Has it ever been a, a view that that might need to be redressed redressed over time because of a, any adverse impact on, on investment uh, in the city as a consequence. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, So, um, through the Chair, there's been uh, various discussions over many years um, with many different elected bodies around our rating structure um, and conversations around who pays and therefore um, who gets services. Um, various pieces of work and we presented this. I don't think you were here, unfortunately, Councillor Kira. Um, we presented um, some um, information in relation to rating policy um, and um, a report that John Comrie undertook um, and a couple of years ago, which you may find informative in terms of how our rating is structured. Um, the principles with how you rate and why you rate um, are obviously set within legislation. Um, and, um, you know, there, there could be some work. I think once things have settled, once we understand um, uh, from this council which services um, they want to move forward with at what level and at what cost, there's certainly some work we can undertake around um, who the beneficiary is and who pays. Um, you, you know, various different um, countries and um, different jurisdictions um, have moved much more from a rating and taxing perspective to a user pays option. Um, and um, that's not something I've heard um, this elected body um, talk to us about before. Um, but if there was, um, you know, a minimal level of service, for example, around waste, it might be you know, a bin pickup you know, once a fortnight, but if a customer wants um, two bins, then it's a user pays approach. So that type of thinking is certainly um, evident in many other jurisdictions, not obviously here in South Australia um, on any sort of big level. So um, in terms of uh, who pays and um, the level of service, that certainly um, I think the data we have as an organisation is way more sophisticated and way more accurate than what we've had in the past to be able um, to have that conversation with members. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Just through the chair to follow up. So g g given, that, uh, given that report, given that information, that sophisticated information that we've got, is there a sense at all that there is any distortion that's present? And I'm just looking at the proposal uh, to increase, there's, I mean there's a proposal to increase um, residential rates by 7.9% and uh, uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a difference, you've got a, a higher residential rate increase uh, proposed than commercial rates and I'm just wondering whether that's something uh, that might also be able to justify in terms of any, 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 any indication that there is essentially a distortion after all of that information that we've all had uh, to look at, um, particularly the administration. Isn't that, isn't that the other way uh, yeah, thanks, just, just back to the chair, just from a commercial property perspective, the information that we're receiving quite regularly at the moment from people like JLL and the like um, is that the Adelaide property market's pretty strong, holding up pretty well. In fact, there's quite a lot of demand for um, commercial property assets in, in and around the CBD from both Sydney, Melbourne and offshore, um, Adelaide alone, Adelaide developers. And I think that would be evidence just with our you know, confidence in ICD and what's going on in the markets. Um, Obviously, we're looking forward to, to some announcement around 88 in due course. Um, but other assets here, JL is saying they're getting a lot of inquiries um, for commercial space, particularly A, a grade office space. So there's definitely a challenge around C and D grade office space in the CBD, no doubt about that. But that's that's probably a slightly different conversation to, to rates. It's probably more about adaptive reuse and how you can extract better value because people are essentially sitting on that asset, on tired assets. Yeah. And, and just to follow up to that through the chair, that, that factors in. Uh, businesses on net leases, obviously, um, as well, doesn't it? You're, you're, you're taking that as an indicator, uh, even for businesses who pay rates directly, um, as well as the uh, gross leases, which where obviously it does reflect that. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Councillor Martin. 
Uh, yeah, two questions. One, could the administration circulate the Comrie report to everybody? It is really an informative document, and I think this discussion would be held enormously if people could see that again. Um, it was, um, the link was in the papers from last week, but we can certainly make that sure really, that's really That's a good document, that would be really useful. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And look, the second thing is, and, and um, I'll, I'll be very blunt about it, it's for the CEO, um, and I'm not seeking um, uh, to uh, apportion blame or anything of the sort, but the last quarterly report, QF1 approved by this council, approved a set of figures um, which show that we're expecting a deficit of almost $40 million in the current financial year. We have deficits in each of the succeeding three financial years up to $21 million. We are likely to have borrowings at the end of this financial year of more than $90 million and a forecast uh, borrowing of somewhere in excess of $200 million by the end of the decade. And then if the administration takes a decision to put to council that it increases rates and charges, has the administration considered that it puts the elected body in a position where if it declines to act, it creates a narrative that enables others to say government needs to act. Has the administration thought that through strategically? Through the chair, yeah, the administration has thought very deeply about the challenge that we have. And I've said quite publicly, uh, it's a circumstance that um, was not predicted. Certainly we knew that We've had seven years of zero rate to dollar increases. We knew that. Certainly, we also knew there was an uh, aggressive spend on infrastructure and asset um, enhancement. What we didn't know was that we would have a pandemic to deal with this year. Um, that as a capital city council, we've been materially impacted. So um, I recognise that the advice that we're providing to you is robust. I recognise it's challenging. Um, but I believe, as the CEO of this council, it's my duty to recommend to you um, an adjustment that can ensure that we do what is required under the Local Government Act and continue to be sustainable from a long-term perspective. So I understand the, um, the, the, the predicament um, that we're in and that I've placed council in, but I do believe you've got, got a duty of care to do that. And has the administration considered the possibility of calls for an administrator if we knock this back? <clears throat> Through the chair, look, I don't, um, I don't wish to entertain that. Um, I don't believe that that is the case. Um, I believe that um, um, we, um, we just need to provide you with clarity over the financial challenge and the opportunity for you to adjust um, how we are how we, are, how, we are, how we are positioned financially. Um, if council chooses not to uh, accept the recommendation of the administration, the only alternative is that we'll, there, we'll have to pull some other levers. That is service reduction, that is greater borrowings. Is that reasonable? That's a, that's a question for the elected member body. Thank you. Councillor Kanal. Just going a little, bit, a little bit of a separate conversation, that is that um, obviously, we've talked about the status quo here and, and moving forward with the various scenarios. Uh, uh, is there going to be a workshop where we're able to again able to start to look at what other options we have, what other uh, sort of potential activities that we can do as a council that can still fit in a remit, and uh, so that we can look at that as, as finding alternatives, uh, you know, as income streams, etc., so that we can alleviate some of this without necessarily having to. Uh, go up in, in rates uh, too significantly. Um, through the presiding member, obviously um, generating new sustainable forms of revenue take time. Um, we absolutely do want to work with council members to make sure that we are 
um, investing um, and um, through the future fund investing in re um, revenue generation um, in terms of um, council's current income mix um, as um, as it's really clear um, only a small you know, half proportion comes from rates the other from fees and charges what we're um, what we're proposing through the future fund is making sure that any um, any uh, income um, goes into revenue generating but in terms of um, ongoing revenue generating that can sit within the general operations that's work that we can do with you but that will take time um, and that segues well into my question I found the 50 million thank you it's because it's not colored it's right at the bottom it is the future fund um, and and that's where the 50 millions are and so regarding that has so if let's say 23 24 we invest 25 million dollars in something we haven't determined yet even though we've been asking for a workshop for 12 months that's okay and then in 24 25 it ups to 50 mil are there any assumptions in there regarding revenue raised off of that we haven't factored in so so within the next within the next five years we're apparently going to be investing 50 million dollars in something as a city substantial amount of money it's going to be revenue generating is there any revenue accounted for in the rest of the long-term financial plan nicole through the chair the future fund is an amount which is available for council to expand there has been no expenditure factored into the long-term financial plan so that would be a decision of council so there is no, to, to clarify, there is no additional income factored in beyond any potential right. rates and tax. So, so let me get this right. We've got a workshop later today where we're talking about using our assets better. And you've presented us with a long-term financial plan, which is far better than they used to be, and that, I'm very grateful for that. Um, but it's got $50 million hanging around for 60% of the balance sheet. It's not generating any revenue. And you're asking us to make a decision based on breaching our prudential limits, sorry, almost breaching our prudential limit in 2030-31 and having net financial liabilities breached in 2030-31 in 10 years' time, yet you've got 50 mil hanging around on in, in your future fund not doing anything. I, I just, I'm flabbergasted, I'm sorry. Uh, is there a question? Me if I'm, well, a question I'm, I would really love to be corrected right now, so please, please do. I, I'd like to correct you. Then go for it. What's the 50 yeah. mil doing? Just one moment, I'll receive the glass on working. See you. Let's do the challenge, I'm going to hear from all. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, essentially, like any budget, the, the administration can only work with the decisions that we've made. We've made a decision on a treasury policy with the future fund, and we know that that income's coming in. So therefore, they can't actually say what the revenue is going to be because we don't know what we're going to spend it on yet and what revenue is going to be generated that. The only revenue we know that we're going to get is once we actually have CMA, for instance, the central market, arcade okay, redevelopment, and that there's going to be a, a revenue generated from that. So until we actually work out what we're going to spend it on, we can't future, we can't predict the future of that. The other thing is that it's very clear that, you know, if we're talking about this as a whole, that the council will make a decision on which parts they're comfortable with. So for instance, we may decide as a council that we aren't as comfortable with the revenue, with the rates going up, but we're more comfortable with the um, fees and charges going up, um, or this, that and the other. So there's any number of permeations that we can do or permutations that we can do um, on the figures that have been given forward. In terms of feedback at the last workshop, um, I don't actually recall anybody saying that they were all for the freeze option. You may have been. I certainly was looking at the break even one and um, but we weren't asked for a decision based on that. So it's a matter of there are things within the budget. The budget can only be what the knowns are at this very point in time. Uh, as opposed to what the unknowns are, um, if we get our act together and um, look at some really, you know, good, well generating uh, investments. That's my answer. And do you have a question? Um, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't no, done with my questions. I, I, oh, sorry, that was an answer to 
Councillor Hyde. Uh, you have if I may, this will be really quick. Um, and so, again, the, the primary issues with the freeze continuing, according to the notes from administration, is, is, is those two things. Both of, both of the issues are in 20, 30, 31, in the 10th year of our long-term financial plan. Through the chair. Uh, what's so, so, so the, the issues highlighted with the long term financial plan, according to the freeze option, is borrowings are forecast to be 96% of prudential limits, and that net financial liabilities uh, uh, will be breached in 2030 31. So the issues, other than that, <coughs> asset sustainability is at 100% every year after this one, the asset test ratio is within its parameters, the interest expense uh, ratio is within its parameters, the leverage test ratio is, all of it is. So it's just two components of our fin financial plan, which are prudential limits, which are 10 years in the future. That's the, those are the primary issues with the LTFP on the freeze, in the freeze scenario. So. Do we have an answer to that? Cool. Through the chair, the with the free scenario, it's accumulation that gets us to that point. Yes, so if we don't act now, that is, and we then keep in mind it is a freeze for one year only. So it assumes from 22, 23, that would, we would go back to increasing property valuations, etc. So that impact of freezing for one year only results in breaching prudential limits and the net financial liabilities ratio. In year 10. 30, 30, 31. In year 10, but on the basis that we're not investing in 50 mil. Correct. However, the operating we will be generating an operating deficit for yep. a number of years, which goes against the financial Five sustainability years. principles. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, sorry, the financial sustainability principles. Where did where did they come from? It's a principle that we should all operate by. But is that a policy? Is that black and white? Councillor Hyde, right? I, I've given you the opportunity. One more question. This oh, one. one more. Through the chair, the local government acts define um, financial sustainability as not putting undue pressure on either ratepayers or um, cuts to services, right. disruptive cuts to services. Okay. So very broad. Uh, my last question is around the asset management plan um, that we're, we're about to implement. And I know that that is a substantial part of all the considerations here. Um, do we, ha has that been implemented yet? Is, is it this wonderful big brain that you're about to flick the switch on and we're going to have visibility on yes. when or if the bridge is going to give way or what like how is that because so that i mean that's that's appearing in here I've got your question can we yeah. get an answer to that when and sorry does it affect the long-term financial plan when you flick the switch will it affect it through the chair the strategic asset management plan will be coming to council in through workshops etc in the early new year um, what we have factored into the long-term financial plan in all scenarios is what will come to you through the SAMP. so any changes or decisions of council will then have a flow-on impact to the long-term financial plan and so we will be Thank making you, future Councilor decisions Hyde, around no around how we treat that and how much we want to maintain our assets etc yes okay answered Okay. Close Members, I think we're going to move on. We've uh, uh, talked a lot about this matter. I know it's a very important issue and um, and I think we've uh, covered a lot of questions in that retrospect. So I'm moving to uh, next item, 510. Thank you. Um, members? Yeah. Who's going to introduce this one? Well, I don't think it needs, needs one. Straight to question. I need to frame. I think we'd agree that that would be the primary. So can you just run us through it, please? All 96 pages or something? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and sum up the 96 pages. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I thought, given the scope and the complexity of the planning system and the planning code, I thought it was worth giving a pricey and a, some context to this piece of work. Um, Dual assessment policy contained in the city plan, or the Adelaide city plan, 
will be replaced in early 2021 by the planning and design code. Um, this, the code will become the new policies or the new rule book, if you like, against which all development assessment decisions will be made. Um, as you can see by the scope of the issues outlined in the paper, the development plan is a wide ranging document or the code is a wide ranging document covering a whole host of issues that relate to the urban development and how the city changes over time. Um, so as, as the plan has done and continues to, it is an important document around how we shape and how the future of the city changes. So it is a critical document from our side to, to get right and to ensure the baseline is right for the future of the city. Um, so in February, February this year, Council adopted a submission on the first version of the code that was released for consultation. Uh, since that time, that there has been a significant amount of discussion and deliberation by the State Planning Commission, a number of papers put out and various parts um, in response to the, the 1700 or so submissions that were re received through that consultation process. Um, what that's resulted in is the revised draft that's been released, which we reviewed and summarised for you in this report. Um, for the City of Adelaide, what that has meant is um, a, a significant amount of change to the policies that were in the first version of the code, um, as well as the introduction of some new policies as well, which we've reviewed as part of this process. Um, what I think would say in summary, the, the updates have addressed some, um, but certainly not all of the items raised in Council's first submission. So what we've attempted to do in, in the report before you is um, set out a response by zone and by overlay and by general development policy, so the sections that are in the code, which outlines the changes that have been made, um, the key concerns that we see are remaining, and then make some recommendations on how that could be addressed through changes to, to the code. So we've attempted to do that through throughout the code. There are some parts of the code, given the time that's been available in this process that we haven't yet had a chance to review, but we've really focused on those ones that are key for the city, city area. Um, in reviewing the code, really our recommendations um, are based on probably seeking two, two main things, a, a functional and fit for purpose first version of the code that supports the aspirations um, of the Commission in delivering the code, which we support around seeking code that streamlines and simplifies the assessment process um, for everyone involved. Um, that's on the basis to really mitigate. So the functional aspect is really around the basis of ensuring we get a code that it minimises the risk of some perverse outcomes or unintended consequences in that first version and also avoids additional time and cost that might, might come through developers through being put through a more complex rather than a simpler process. Um, and then a code that, that recognises and provides for the local as well as the capital city functions of the City of Adelaide area. So in terms, really in terms of the, the comment, commentary on the code, um, I'll probably sum it up in this way. There are, there are a number of omissions and omissions in two ways at this point in the code of, of policy that we think should be translated across as well as policy by the way the code's constructed that may not apply to certain forms of development. Those are things we think can be fixed. Um, there are a number of errors that we've identified and picked up in the review of the code. There are also some refinements we'd suggest that could be made and some inconsistencies um, that we've identified. What this has done is has made the review quite a complex task and probably somewhat difficult at this stage to say we have a real full understanding of what, I guess, how the code may be implemented and what, what it might mean. Um, whilst there, probably the next would be that whilst there has been um, certainly the zones that are provided and the framework of the code, we think, um, provides a good basis for the city and being able to deliver the city's aspirations. There still is a significant amount of local policy which we would say needs to be um, inserted into the code in terms of translating across the current outcomes that are in the development plan. And so we have attempted to summarise those um, within the code. It's difficult to suggest what the most important ones are because it's, it's, it's really dependent on what you're dealing with at the time and what's the nature of the development in front of you. But that's fair to say there's a number of those.
um, or significant number across the code. Um, probably, I guess, really summing up, for, we're certainly clear that the code will be landed at some point early, early next year. So I think we're certainly in we have a final phase of consultation. It will be a first version of the code, and I certainly see that there will be iterative, there will be amendments and a number of amendments that will come soon after. And there's a number that we have identified that we would suggest should, should be pursued following this first version of the code. Um, but really, we're at this point where we certainly are seeking your feedback um, on what are those really critical issues that we need to ensure in that first version of the code. So we do is manage that the outcomes in the city. So that is a summary, um, just questions. Councillor Hyde. Um, uh, through you, Chair, thank you. Thank you, Rick. That's um, uh, very insightful. Planning's not my forte, but um, you've summed it up fairly, fairly succinctly. Um, regarding uh, city main street zones, uh, I, I, I wish to understand if, if that is a precise recreation of the existing main streets in, in the development plan. Uh, yes, it does. The main street zones would cover yep. the areas that are, yes, yes it is. Right. Um, and what, what sort of process, if we as a city decided that we wished to identify a further area in the city as a main street. Uh, what would be the process to, to getting that included in the code? Is, is, is that, uh, I suppose, from, from start to finish? Yep. Um, you would need, council would need to initiate and request a code amendment from the minister. So quite a, quite a similar process to happens now through a development plan amendment process. So council would request that from the minister. And, and okay, that so it's, it's fundamentally not that different. Um, I think where the city is in some fortunate situation is we do have a number of zones and most of the zones in the city will only apply within the city of Adelaide. Mm -hmm. um, most other council areas will be sharing zones with other councils and given the merging of all the individual development plans together, um, where, and I guess this does relate in some ways to the main streets and other parts, where we're looking at changing policy that would apply elsewhere, that would be probably a different process to apply as now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, understood. Thank you. Members, it's not. Um, yeah, look, I just um, uh, want to um, uh, provide some feedback with a question on the end. Um, uh, somebody who does understand planning much better than I um, actually said to me, this is the clearest exposition yet on the uh, the state government's proposed changes and uh, has suggested, and I would like to talk to the administration about it, um, some refinements in regard to the Riverbank zone and the Adelaide Parklands uh, zone. Um, but it, it does, according to the person um, whose commentary um, informs me, uh, suggest that the uh, the planning minister should actually cease contemplation of introducing this by uh, February 2021, because it is and remains, according to the correspondent at Croc. Um, would it be as flawed as that review suggests still in your view? Sorry, Councillor, I'm not exactly sure which review. Well, it's, it's flawed in respect of that. Uh, it's, it's a rhetorical question. Well, I suppose it is a rhetorical question, yes. Is it a crock? Uh, I don't have to answer that, thank you. Um, <laughs> Councillor Hyde? Uh, yeah, just clarity regarding the City High Street subzone. Um, exempts catalyst sites from ensuring buildings mitigate overshadowing and visual impacts. Um, so it's so so do catalyst sites presently and they will continue to maintain uh, that exemption that they don't need to comply or, or do anything to mitigate those issues is that correct um yeah through the chair i think that's one that i suggest we're still reviewing and trying to ensure the outcome is clear in the policy so um catalyst sites will continue um in the code we're looking at refining and continuing to refine the wording to reflect the current development plan so all of those matters that relate to context are considered on a catalyst side equally yeah uh, and just 
furthermore, um, so these high street subzones, uh, they're the same effectively north ward and south ward. Um, but how does how how are the how are the height differences reconciled in that? Because I understand all current heights will be carried over as they are, but from memory, I don't think the heights are all uniform along along no. these particular streets. So how how, is, how are those two policy objectives reconciled? Um, this comes to how the code is is constructed in, in the new system. So the, the high limits are shown through a mapping system that is separate to the zoning policy. So you need to read the mapping corresponding with the zone. Current plan, the heights are shown in the zone. In the code, they're shown in a separate layer of the code. So I can confirm though that the heights proposed in the code are the same they as they are in the current development plan. But, but has, so, so legally speaking, the code is drawing from this mapping, what is that? Is that is that gazetted? Is that in the legislation? Uh, yes, as part of legislation, um, brings in the ability for the code to be in the e planning, what will be called the e planning system. So all of the policy and all the layers will sit within the spatial the spatial system. Yes. Sit inside the spatial yeah. system, and so through the chair, legally speaking, what is the process for then changing that? Is that solely the purview of the minister to change at their whim? Um, or is there a process around what sits in the e-planning system? It's the same process to amend any policy in the code, so it'd be a code amendment process. Which is just, which is, it, this is basically delegated legislation, right, at this point? Uh, I'm not sure. It's, not, it's not going through the parliament. Uh, no, the minister and the commission have the power to bring so, in the code. Yep. yep. Yeah, okay. Thank okay. you, Councillor Hyde. Councillor John. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a quick one you asked uh, through the Chair. Which points are uh, to potentially highlight in this first iteration? And I think your points around um, land division and the relationship to regulated or significant trees is one of those that's changed significantly in this second draft and the impact that that will have on our entire community and our plans around tree canopy. I think are pretty substantial as you've identified and articulated, but that's one thing that I think would be worth highlighting and strengthening potentially if there's an opportunity to do that. Thank you. Question? No question? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Members, we have three items to consider in confidence. Yeah. Uh, 7.1 and 7.2 and 7.3. So I seek a mover and a seconder for, uh, a, mo for a motion to uh, order the exclusion for the public for 7.1. Can I have a mover? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Seconder. Thank you, Councillor Kira. Would you please speak to it, Lord Mayor? Uh, Councillor Kira. Uh, those who are in favour? Those who are against, motions carry. I seek a mover and second also for 7.2. So uh, can I have a mover? Uh, Councillor Donovan, <laughs> sorry. Uh, second to Councillor Canal. Uh, would you like to speak to him? No, Councillor Canal, no. Um, those in favour? Those against? Carry. And also 7.3, Councillor Canal, second Lord Mayor, I'd like to speak to it. No, Lord Mayor, yes. Any I, I, yes, I wish to speak against this. Um, this strategic property action plan ought to be in the public realm, um, given our financial circumstances. Uh, I think it's incumbent on this council to share with ratepayers whatever information it can that would uh, in any way um, uh, ameliorate their concerns about our current position. And I think keeping this sort of thing confidential, uh, entirely confidential, I understand that some information does need to be excluded, I think actually does us and our ratepayers of the service. Thank you, Councillor Martin and Councillor Hyde. Um, I'm going to take the unusual step of agreeing with Councillor Martin uh, on this one, particularly given the item that we considered before on our budgetary position, um, the potential ramifications that this item 7.3 uh, and implications that it will have 
uh, potentially for aspects of our long-term financial plan. Um, uh, you don't for for things that may be going into the future fund, all those sorts of things. Um, and I'm not saying that we should have a discussion that we should have a discussion outside of confidence about specific things which are very commercially sensitive. But at a minimum, the principles, um, because the principles underpinning the strategic property action plan are solid. Um, uh, they are they are good principles. Um, and they're principles that will be more likely to lead to good decisions, but they are uh, decisions that will fundamentally impact uh, our financial planning, the rates that we're going to be levying or not levying, um, and all manner of things. And that's why I, I do believe that this um, should be considered in part in public. There are parts of the report that shouldn't be in public, um, uh, and I acknowledge that they are very commercially sensitive and would adversely affect our position. But the discussion still needs to be had because of the ramifications. This, you know, the discussion that's had in confidence, not here but in council, could drastically alter what we do or don't do regarding future budgets and expenditure or not. Um, and I, I think that's that is a discussion which is in the public interest in the context we're in now. Six months ago, it wasn't, but right now it is, and it greatly concerns me that we're only having one side or one you know, quarter of the argument with our, with our rate payers, um, uh, which subsequently is all the bad news. Um, and I think there's a lot more discussions to be had and people would actually be comforted that we're having those discussions. Um, cool. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Or not. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, to, in, in addition to that, I think it's a matter of how we separate what we can discuss in public and what we can't. The report for us is not separated into that and therefore it would be uh, a, a request, I guess, uh, of the CEO to lift the confidence around the bits that we can as soon as possible so that it can be in public. I will still be voting for it to be in confidence. Would do it, does the administration want to make a comment on any of that? Well, through you, Chair, I think um, it is very important that this matter be kept in confidence at this time, the way the report is drafted. Certainly, um, subsequent reports on this topic, we can specifically target the opportunity to have an open agenda conversation. Because I, I do agree that there is, you know, it is quite valid to have a generalised conversation openly. But at this time, with the content of this report, I do believe it's um, necessary to maintain confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Okay, members, those in favour? Those against? Okay, motion's carried. Okay.